All good. Okay, your 15 minutes starts now. Okay. Um, I'm Wilko Banovman. I'm going to talk to you about uh, SpaceNet. Uh, it's uh, federated authentication for secure roaming wireless network access across hackerspaces and these kind of community events. Um, yes, slide please. So um, the uh, SpaceNet is part of uh, SpaceFed, which is a federated platform for uh, authentication across hackerspaces and hacker events. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about uh, SpaceFed and then SpaceNet and tell you why it's useful and how it does work and what kind of security it actually offers and what it does not offer. Um, and also how you can help with um, setting up some more federated projects. Slide please. Okay. Um, we started uh, in November 2011. Um, but the idea actually came on earlier to do this, um, the federated hackerspace thing. Uh, one of the things we had was like, uh, we were at a, a hacker event and everybody was sniffing everybody else's traffic. And we thought, well, there must be a better way to do this while still providing uh, proper uh, security and also to be anonymous. Um, that's uh, that's why we we actually got together and thought about how we're going to do this, um, and also to have some sort of roaming access. Uh, if I open my laptop at another hackerspace, I want it to just work, but I don't want everything to be public, just out of the box. I mean, for me, it doesn't matter. I use a VPN anyway, but most people do not. So it will actually offer just a little bit of more extra security. Um, SpaceFed is a, is a federated authentication platform. Um, we try to do everything as decentralized as we can possibly do it. So um, there is SpaceNet, which is uh, basically uh, WPA2 enterprise uh, with radius access and uh, roaming, where you can actually go to your own hackerspace and authenticate there and then your home hackerspace will, will say to the current Wi-Fi solution you're on, will say, this user is okay. I don't know who it is. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but this is a user is okay, which is good. Uh, another one of the projects that we do is uh, we're going to do some SAML. Um, we've actually already started doing SAML um, to uh, link all the authentication and, again, not have the password on our infrastructure, but only to your home server and that you have at your own hackerspace or, or hacker community. And uh, that will tell us, okay, this, is, this user is okay, and we do not want to know your password. All we want to have is the assertion, you're okay. So uh, another one is uh, Space Connect, which is basically uh, a decentralized VPN in, in pretty much the same way and some phone systems that we're going to link. So basically it's all inter-hacker space related projects that we're trying to do under one single umbrella of uh, cooperation between hacker space. Slide please. So this talk is about SpaceNet. Um, well, federated authentication, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit like Adrom. How many people here know Adrom? Okay, okay, so I'm gonna have to explain it anyway. Um, it's uh, WPA2 Enterprise, which basically means that you are going to ha uh, be able to log on to a Wi Fi uh, with your username and password and not with a pre shared key. And the advantage is uh, that the pre shared key is not actually used to um, set up your session key. So your session key comes from the radius server and that will mean you're more secure than you are with a PSK because public Wi-Fi with a, with a pre-shared key is not actually offer more security than just public Wi-Fi because the pre-shared key will be used to encrypt the, the session key. And from then on, if you have the initial negotiation with the pre-shared key, um, you're screwed anyway. Um, the, the main thing it does is it, it allows you to specify your username. In my case, uh, wilco at bitlayer.nl. 
and it will just go to BitLayer, authenticate me, and it will pass back. It's okay. So username and password. Uh, one of the advantages is you can configure it once, and you can actually use it everywhere. Um, and if you use the certificate checking of your home radius server, because it's actually a TLS tunnel, it will be as secure as you can get it right now, the current state of technology. So it's, uh, it's essentially a radius proxy. Uh, slide, please. Okay, so why is it useful? Um, well, it's very easy to use. Um, you can configure it once, use everywhere. It works on most clients. I've actually not seen clients that do not work fundamentally. Some clients require some hacks to get it working, but yeah, that's a client issue, I'm afraid. Um, it is secure. Well, secure as we can get it right now. Um, keys are dynamic, so um, no session keys. Um, every user gets a single session with a secure handshake, which is good. Um, it works uh, at um, all connected spaces and events, like this one. Um, I could just open up my laptop and we have SpaceNet here right now. Um, and my laptop will just connect to the Wi-Fi and my session will be encrypted and uh, I don't have to worry about anyone sniffing my traffic up until the, the gateway actually or until we actually hit the wired network. So that's good. Um, right now we have um, uh, spaces connected in the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Germany, United Kingdom, um, and also some events we did in Malaysia, Hack in a Box, and uh, well, hopefully your space will be connected next week as well. That would be great. If you have uh, um, not, uh, if you don't have a country node yet, um, because it's all federated and delegated to every single country, so just contact us and we can uh, work something out to connect you as well. Um, well, it can uh, it can regulate your your network access, which is good. Um, it can do wired as well. You can do 802.1x authentication on your wired ports. You can actually do some some uh, useful stuff like saying, "Hey, this is a guest user because this is not from my realm. It is from, um, for example, RefSpace." And you can no, I don't trust these RefSpace guys. I'm going to put them in a different VLAN. I will just work if your access point supports this kind of stuff. So you can uh, determine pretty much based on which uh, server you're authenticating with uh, what VLAN it will go into or not if you trust everyone equally. Uh, slide please. Um, so this is basically um, the, the layout of how this works. Um, you are uh, at the bottom left connected to the local access point. Um, the access point will do, um, or actually your client will do an EAP all session. That's uh, EAP over LAN, extensible authentication protocol. Um, and it will make a connection to your uh, access point. The access point will make a radius connection and the radius will see, hey, this realm is not my local realm. So we'll forward it to the country node. In this case, the, the would be the German node. That will see, hey, this is user is bitlayer.nl, and bitlayer.nl should be forwarded to the Dutch node, NL node, um, which will see, hey, oh wait, this is bitlayer.nl, that's this server, and will connect me to my home radius. And from then on, I'm connected to the proper server, I will do a TLS session. So um, I will have an encrypted end-to-end -end connection with my home radius, and then I'm sending my username and password to my home server and just my home server. And it's uh, TLS encrypted. You have to check the certificate or otherwise you don't know who you're sending your password to. Um, so configure your client that you're actually checking the certificate. Um, and then basically you will say, okay, this user is okay and we'll forward this back to the, home, to the country node of the home radius, back to the country node of the country you're actually in and to the local radius and your access point will just say, okay, you are good, you can be on my Wi-Fi and um, this is your session key for now and that way will actually be secure. Um, so next slide please. Uh, it's five minutes. Yep. 
Um, so how does it work? Um, proxying is based on the domain name in your identity, actually in your outer identity. There's actually two kinds of identity here. You have the one inside the TLS session and one outside of the TLS session. Uh, the one on the outside, which is in my case, would be something like anonymous at bitlayer.nl, and that one is only used to, to proxy to the proper server. So it does not actually reveal your identity on the network. It will just pass it through to your home radius, and from there on, it's your inner identity that you do authentication with. So they, there's no link between the two. So you can actually be anonymous. Um, uh, it's a TLS session, um, which I just explained. Um, the authorization to actually connect comes from the radius server, and it will actually hand out the session key to the client via ePOL, and then there's some profit involved. Next slide. Okay, so uh, who do I have to trust? That's also always a good question. Well, definitely not us, because we do not get your passwords, which is basically a common theme between all the SpaceFed projects. We do not want to, your passwords, and actually, we do not want you to trust us. Actually, the only thing you are allowed, we, you should trust us with, is that we will only connect hacker spaces and hacker communities, and that's the only level of trust you have to have in us, so that you know okay, this person comes from SpaceNet, so it must be some sort of hacker-related community that's actually going to do the authorization. Um, but it is as secure as the weakest link. Um, yes, over the air will be secure using WPA2 Enterprise, um, but um, SpaceNet in and of itself does not protect against Layer 2 networking attacks. So if you were gonna set up your own wireless, um, you have to check for things like ARP spoofing, rogue DHCP, uh, neighbor discovery spoofing, and rogue router advertisements. Um, those are things that can still hijack your session, uh, despite the fact that your link is encrypted. So um, you can uh, have some monitoring for that, or you, have, you can have some uh, infrastructure that's actually um, uh, already protected against this sort of attack. Um, so it is as secure as the weakest link, obviously, um, but at least over the air is secure. You can't just sniff out a packet through the air, which is good. Um, yeah, the, the default gateway administrator, yeah, that's your link to the internet. If everybody has access on your uh, default gateway box, and well, then obviously everyone can see the traffic. So secure it or not and tell people that, yeah. Um, of course, the identities are anonymous. I don't even know who you are. I don't have your password. I don't know who you are. Uh, all I know is this guy, uh, RefSpace or Random Data, actually says this user is okay. Well, that's good enough for me. You can get on my wireless. Um, only the home radius actually knows who you are. That's good. Um, yeah, it's the next best thing to VPNs. Uh, of course, it's not as secure as a VPN where you control the entire chain, but at least you control it up to the, the wired network um, that the sniffing will not be possible yet, obviously, yet. Um, next slide, please. Um, yes, MS Chap V2. Um, as if you want to support Windows clients, you have to support MS Chap V2. Or use a tool called uh, Secure W2 to provision the profile on it. Um, but hey, isn't MSCAP V2 vulnerable? Well, yes it is. It and has in fact been broken for years. Um, One minute. Right, but it is used uh, within PEEP, so that's uh, good. It's in, inside the TLS session, so it's all good. Um, next slide, please. Uh, well, how can I get it? Well, you need some things. Um, basically, you need an uh, access point with uh, enterprise support, you need some radius settings and um, virtual machine to set up the radius server, um, user directory, fixed IP address, and some clue. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the seconds. events that are using it. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so, yes. Um, these are actually already connected. Next slide, please. Okay, excellent. Um, Want to help? You can contact us. Thank you.
so as you can see, sometimes even 15 minutes <clears throat> is not enough. Um, Felix, are you in the audience? Ready to go? Okay, great. We're just going to jump right into the next talk. Um, everybody who's coming in through the sides, we still, even now, have plenty of space over on this side of the room. Um, right now, we are in the 15-minute session. Uh, we have four 15-minute talks, and then we're going to jump right back into 15-minute lighting talks. We are actually going, it's not on the schedule, but we will take a short, short break between the 15-minute talks and the five-minute talks because I do not yet have all of the slides um, that were promised for the uh, other lightning talks, and we'll fit other things in there as well. So without any further ado, Felix, are you ready to go? Are we all, all settled? Let's let some people come in and out. And if we could have your attention, your 15 minutes starts now. All right, I would like to talk to you about advanced aerodynamics based on non-divergent fractal fluids models, which means uh, new models based on fractals and um, not on voxel grid based on uh, navier strokes equations like they are um, done now. Next slide, please. So even with um, supercomputer render power, it, uh, the, the mo most common um, Questions are not um, understood properly, uh, which is the, um, where this, this understanding of lift. So there's there are three um, competing um, theories where where you can explain lift. Um, which the most um, popular one is Bernoulli, uh, where where it say the, the faster air creates a lower pressure over the top of the wing, and then by this um, lifts the wing up. And the more modern way is um, Newton. Um, some people um, since 10 years uh, um, argument about the impulse change and the downwash of air. And um, also modern discussion is uh, the Martin William Kutta condition, which adds a rotation um, motion over um, a wing which deflects the air downwards. Next slide, please. Um, let's start with the um, most popular idea of Bernoulli, Bernoulli um, um, you, you often um, argument that two particles, um, one is um, passing the wing below and the upper passing up, up above the wing, um, have to meet again at the end of the wing. And so, so by this, um, the upper particle has to um, pace up and um, there's no mechanical reason why should they, they dance together at the end of the wing. Um, so this is not very a proper explanation and it's also a bit old fashioned. Next slide, please. This um, idea is based on the research of Bernoulli of uh, pressure tubes where there is a, a small cross section in between and uh, therefore the remaining the um, mass continuum flow, um, the speed has to go up and by that acceleration it's uh, recorded that, uh, that the, the, measure, the measurement shows a lower of static pressure. And so, um, but next slide, please. It often comes from uh, understanding of mechanics, like um, when there is a mass on a ramp uh, exposed to a um, um, gravity field, and um, the potential high um, means the potential force, where when the ramp decreases, um, the um, potential energy goes uh, converted into speed. And, um, but this only works if you have an external field um, happening. Um, next slide, please. Um, if uh, this also um, create, uh, creates spontaneous motion in a, a pressure tube, uh, you would also can say that, that the tale of um, Münchhausen would be true, that uh, it can happen spontaneous motion out of nothing, and uh, it would be actually a violation against the Newton's action and reaction uh, principle. Next slide, please. How um, can we... Um, uh, make an evidence of that, that is um, wrong understanding. Um, next slide, please. Um, to um, matter won't change to second law of Newton, um, its direction if there is not an additional force um, applied, so um, that um, matter streams inside the measuring tube, you have to apply additional force um, to deflect the, the, the pressure in this direction. 
and um, therefore you have to withdraw um, pressure uh, force and this is uh, recorded then as a pressure drop. Next slide please. So also you can um, Convert the pedal equation into um, um, the sorry Bernoulli equation into the central pedal equation very easily, which can show that there um, is uh, the central pedal forces uh, acting in uh, this measurement. So actually, it can say that what I measure is not real. Um, Next slide, please. It also can be argumented by, by momentum conservation, where um, we say on the left side, um, uh, the forces can only um, um, act in a 90 degree angle, and by this um, by this in an in inelastic push, there has been uh, energy released, and which goes into turbulence. Uh, right side shows a, another example of a static a static condition, where you can see that the forces can apply equally, and so there uh, the forces are remain static. Uh, in the measurement. Next slide, please. And even natural researches uh, on streams show that uh, the, the pressure level is um, is uh, highly uh, relative to uh, to the to the location um, of the of the in the stream. So um, due inertial movement of mass, um, you don't have equal uh, pressure levels and only there where the, the inertial mass allows it to. Next slide, please. So conclusion, we can say that Bernoulli found a direct correlation between speed and measurement, but this does not describe the true fluid mechanics. Next slide, please. Um, according to um, hydraulic law, you can say that there has, been, has to be uh, happen um, an equal acceleration force, otherwise you would um, compensate forces, and so um, the, the exceeding um, force um, force uh, causes the acceleration and that thereby the, the diameter of the of the ideal um, ideal flow body um, uh, shapes um, hyperbolically and also decreases in uh, by, by by time and speed and and so you have great, get an, an ideal flow fluid body inside the, um, the stream and this um, to, to maintain static the uh, the outer parts of the stream are um, braced by by turbulent um, um, boundary layer and shearing um, motion next slide please and uh, when when you are now look at the, the pressure drop uh, you will recognize that there has been a lack of energy because uh, the potential um, um, pressure has decreased after the passing of the cross section and um, there, thereby um, there must be an explanation why, where the, the remaining energy uh, went to because the speed is at the same level than before passing the cross section it can be explained very easily that um, the, the, the kinetic energy is trapped inside the vortices where the speed um, remains the same. But uh, in global, the, um, the, the, the traveling of the whole, whole stream is, is, um, is, um, has the old speed. So um, next slide, please. Um, you can say that this is a um, classic um, hydrodynamic uh, resistor. Next slide, please. And um, to understand the statics inside the stream, you can say that the, there is a trunk in the middle, which is the main stream, the, the ideal um, form of, um, of the hyperbolic shape, where there are um, fractal branches um, split off and brace the, the other statics and um, um, compensate the, the um, inequality of forces um, to remain a mechanical system. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, nature so shows us uh, many, exam many examples like cloud motion and stuff like that where these um, tree-like um, architecture or force, um, forces are applied, unlike uh, how it's explained in Bernoulli. Next slide, please. And the idea is, uh, for instance, uh, enhancing the 3D um, um, mandel bulbar, which is able to create 3D fractals, um, because normally the fractals are 2D, and uh, into 4D fractals where you can uh, emerge um, motion in time and space. And um, next slide, please. Um, so this this algorithm would look for instable moment in the liquid, where there is um, external uh, information amplified into the matter and tells whether the, the the matter is collapsing into the next stable moment compared to never strokes um, which is uh, based on grids um, and just looks for uh, the divergent motion between the, the voxels and uh, by that um, applying um, 
a different equation, which is not very accurate because um, uh, because of self-similar features of fractals, um, you never hit the true shape. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you, so we can say that um, even ideas of um, such people like Rupert Sheldrake, um, the morphogenic field can all be uh, applied in mathematical evidence where you can say that the virtual information is in amplified in matter and so you can say that matter is actually an amplifier of um, virtual information which is displayed in instable moment of fluid, for instance. And it also explains emergent information which uh, like sand dunes where, where there's um, features. Yeah, okay, next slide, please. So how a uh, lift is created then? Next slide, please. Um, you can say that um, it's a combination of new, uh, Newton and vacuum force. Next slide, please. Where um, the inertial mass travels over a convex surface where normally uh, it would change a direction um, and uh, so vacuum spreading unless there is um, pressure inside the, the air and uh, this, um, th this pressure potential gets withdrawn and uh, deflects the air back onto the surface. Next slide, please. So the air follows in a, in a, s a certain delay. Well, in between there is a little um, pressure bubble because, it, it, because the air is too inert, uh, it cannot turn into the bubble and collapse it uh, unless the, the angle is small enough, but if the angle increases, uh, the air is able to um, travel along um, big enough uh, circles to uh, travel inside the pressure bubble and make it collapse by that way and uh, um, gets, the, the, the pressure gets detached by, by vortices. Next slide, please. Um, also, nature um, shows uh, th this um, on, on, on birds when they approach in a steep attack angle on landing maneuvers, for instance, where the feathers lift to um, inertial effects, but only to a certain distance when they reach the laminar um, stream. Next slide, please. So how we can apply this technically um, is like um, we have a um, uh, um, flexible surface of a wing with elements like feathers, which are get shaped into um, form uh, according to the pressure potential um, uh, applied at this certain situation. And so in e each situation, uh, the, the form is always getting an ideal shape. Also, when getting in star mode, the, the, um, the elements get ripped off and protecting the, the pressure bubbles uh, above the elements from, uh, from collapsing where the, the stream only can flow up below the, the elements. Next slide, please. I created a nice um, movie which explains in more deeper level of the um, aerodynamic behavior on on airplanes, and um, and also yeah shows nice um, uh, high speed anal analysis and uh, yeah here you can see uh, quite nice um, uh, how the elements get get. Um, pulled into the stream to a certain level until they reach the laminar um, area and, and so protect um, the, um, the collapsing of the um, low pressure bubbles. And um, yeah, okay, next slide, yeah. I've also publicated an um, article which is going more deeply in, into physics and um, explaining it on certain other effects and um, also there's my YouTube user channel and uh, the Facebook page where I mostly um, update these, uh, these uh, projects. Um, can we get to the last slide again? Because there's still some time. Um, I, to mention this is the first model which is not um, that perfect. Um, so, so this is version 1.0 and uh, I already got some conclusions about this, um, this how to improve this uh, in a more deeper level because there are some material issues and also some vortex generation uh, issues which uh, have to be improved. Um, so um, um, you have two minutes left. We could go watch the video if you like. Oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just um, pick maybe the first one, uh, if you can reach it very quickly. Okay, didn't estimate it that. Was uh, very much rushing through the um, issue and um,
So it's um, I'm filmed with a GoPro camera, but uh, for this model it was a little bit too heavy. And um, so um, I only could get nice um, flights um, without the camera, because, um, but, but even with the camera you get nice effects. Um, so this is the first um, without the elements, and you see you, 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 the, the, the plane gets into stall mode, and then the, the, the pressure drops, and then uh, it, it drops very, very fast. And uh, now the, the same effect with, um, with uh, the, the, the elements, and you can see the behavior is very constant and, and equal. And um, it's yet just with um, gliding flights, but, but uh, I'm working on uh, motor um, flights. And um, yeah, so this is explaining again a little bit how the, the, um, uh, the, the mechanics work. Um, yeah, we have these, um, with these elements which uh, get shaped into by the stream. And um, when you have normal flight modes, they should be um, layered together. And, um, and then if the pressure increases, the, 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 the air moves them in shape uh, until they reach a critical 30 seconds. You can maybe speed up a little bit the, the video for one minute. Yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah that's just more important to see in, in action. Yeah, that's okay, that's fine. So you can see the, the elements are not entirely lifted off, but just in a certain level when they reach the lamina um, border of, of the stream. And um, I have the other videos is more, I'm going more into detail. This is the first video, then the other one is having longer flights and uh, more precise analysis of this um, flight model. And so. we're at time, I didn't get a chance to ding your 10 seconds, so <laughs> we're good. So yeah, that's it, you good? Could you have imagined trying to present all that in five minutes? <laughs> Fifteen probably wasn't enough. All right, so uh, we're going to keep jumping right into it. We are in the 15-minute uh, portion of the lightning talks. Oh, what? I am? Oh, right, sorry. Hello. You good? Okay. And if we're ready to go, everybody's we've readjusted in the room. Uh, also, everybody who's back there, if you could remind all the people who might come in during this session, we've never filled that section over there uh, with chairs. So have them have them go. Keep keep walking back over there. Just don't go backstage to reach there. And are we ready to go? Okay, we've got another 15-minute session, which starts now. Nun, ich fange mal mit einer der ersten deutschen Session heute an. Uh, mein Name ist Leon von Tippeskirch. Ich stelle das vor, was ich mit René Treffer zusammen gemacht habe. Der Name ist wie Kaffee Magnetischütz, die Elliptic Curve Cryptography auf der BitTorrent DAT. Slide. Für allen, die während dem Talk etwas langweilig ist, können den Source Code jetzt gleich auschecken. Oben sieht man dann weiterhin auch den GitHub-Account für alle, die später reinkommen. Es ist relativ einfach zu starten. Man braucht die OpenSSL-Tools, die normalen Build-Tools und kann sich hier mit der DAT von dem, der größten, der Candemlia von BitTorrent verbinden. Funktioniert aber genauso mit allen anderen DATs. Slide. Erstmal, was ist ein DAT? DAT. Sehr vereinfacht ausgedrückt ist wie ein Key Value Store. Man hat einen Key, einen Value. Der Key ist der Hash oder an dem Beispiel von großen bitteren Netzwerken, die nach deutschen Parteien benannt sind, Magnet Links. Und dahinter verbergen, verbirgt sich dann die Liste an Peers, die man kontaktieren muss. Und diese Peers, jeder sucht sich dann zufällig einen dieser Peers. Hier in Zahlen raus, das ist 160 Bit und der Magnet Link ist der SHA-1, 
deswegen auch die 160 Bit und Slide. Man sucht sie sich vorher zufällig aus und dann die, die am nächsten zu dem ähm, gewünschten Key sind, wie hier das 2CAFE, ähm, routen es dann dorthin. Darüber ist es dann distributed. Hier haben wir die beiden Peers, Peer 1 CAFC und Peer 2 CAFF, die eben die nächsten sind und die das Routing dort weitermachen. Sollte aber jetzt jemand versuchen, 2 CAFE nicht mehr erreichbar zu machen, kann er, Slide, ähm, so eine sogenannte Eclipse Attack ausführen. Die IDs sind hier vollkommen frei wählbar. Er wählt also zwei, die sehr nahe an der ähm, Ziel-ID sind und die in, jetzt in rot gezeichnet sind, verschweigen einfach die Existenz von 2 CAFE und es ist nicht mehr erreichbar. Slide. Jetzt ist die Frage, wie kann man das nicht komplett verhindern, aber es auf jeden Fall erschweren. Wir sagten vorher, die Peers haben eine zufällige ID. Wenn diese ID nicht mehr zufällig ist, immer noch weiterhin 160 Bit, sondern man einen Key erzeugt für die Public Key Encryption, dann ist es ja nicht einfach, einen zufälligen zu wählen. Wir haben uns dazu entschieden, die Elliptic Curve Cryptography zu nehmen, und zwar mit einer Länge von 176 Bit. Vorne diese ersten 16 Bit werden festgelegt auf 02 CAFE und dann bleiben die restlichen 160 Bit übrig, um dann den Public Key zu erzeugen. Unten sieht man den Vergleich mit einem Algorithmen Slide. Hier wäre zum Beispiel einer, ein Prozess, wie man das jetzt bisher machen würde. Man würde sich einen Key erzeugen. Das dauert etwas, auf einem aktuellen Rechner ungefähr eine Minute. Es hat einen Hash, ähm, der beginnt hier mit 02 CAFE, nimmt den letzten Teil, 100, die letzten 160 Bit, announced den normal als seine Peer-ID, die vorher frei gewählt war, eröffnet seine DAT und ähm, startet seinen Ping und benutzt die DAT wie bisher. Slide. So würde es zum Beispiel aussehen, wenn, die, wenn man mit jemandem spricht, der auch die gleiche Kryptografie benutzt. Man, startet, man hat Alice und Bob haben ihren Private und Public Key. Alice macht ein Ping, setzt in dem Bison noch die Variable, dass er Encryption spricht. Bob sagt, ja okay, das ist ja ganz nett. Ähm, ich encrypte mein Pong mit dem Public Key von Alice, der ja die ID ist, das heißt, er ist vorher bekannt, es gibt keinen vorherigen Handshake. Alice kann diesen Pong encrypten, sagt ja. Er kann auf jeden Fall encryption, er spricht dieselbe Version, alles ist gut. Ich, in der weiteren Kommunikation benutze ich einfach Bobs Public Key, der seine Node-ID ist, plus 02 CAFE. Und die weitere Kommunikation kann encrypted stattfinden. Slide. Sollte es so sein, dass Bob noch kein Encryption spricht, wie im Moment 100% der DHT, schickt man den Parameter weiterhin mit. Bob ignoriert ihn, antwortet unencrypted, man hält ihn in seiner normalen Liste für unencrypted Clients und kann weiterhin seine DHT aufbauen. Slide. Sollte Bob aber versuchen, so zu tun, als wäre er encrypted, kann er, kann er zwar den, die Antwort, das Pong, Encrypted zurückschicken, weil er hat ja Alice Public Key. Sobald aber Alice dann weiter mit ihm redet, kann er die Daten, die er von Alice bekommt, nicht mehr encrypten, äh, unencrypten, weil er ja den Private Key zu seiner ID nicht hat. Slide. Die, die Vorteile gegenüber der normalen DHT und anderen Ideen ist, dass der DHT-Verkehr insgesamt encrypted ist. Das heißt, bis auf den ersten Ping, den könnte man auch encrypten. Im Moment ist es zu dem Punkt der Abwärtskompatibilität einfach ein ganz normaler unencrypteter Ping. Es gibt keinen Handshake und keinen Round, zusätzlichen Roundtrip. Das heißt, der Overhead ist sehr gering, obwohl eine Encryption initiiert wird, weil der Public Key durch die ID eh schon bekannt ist. Die extra Payload 
pro DHT-Paket ist mit 22 Bytes relativ gering. Es wird eben ein temporärer Key erzeugt. Man sollte hier nicht mit dem Public Key Encryption, mit dem Ephemeral Key. Es ist weiterhin abwärtskompatibel. Das Beispiel, was ich euch vorher gezeigt habe und was man in der Adresse oben rechts auch klonen kann, kann sich ja mit der normalen DHT genauso verbinden, sprich dann halt unencrypted. Der Public Key ist bekannt, das heißt, man hat einen Public Key von einem Host, mit dem man kommunizieren möchte. Das heißt, in oberen Ebenen kann man den weiterverwenden oder zum neuen Handshake verwenden. Und ein weiterer Vorteil davon ist, man kann, was vorher, sie waren frei wählbar, die IDs, konnte man einfach die ID eines anderen annehmen. Man wählt einfach die gleiche ID. Das ist mit Encryption sehr viel schwieriger, da man ja nicht die gleiche ID, den gleichen Private Key dazu hat. Dann müsste man ja errechnen. Slide. Wir haben das Ganze auf der dat referenzimplementierung die auch in Transmission verwendet wird. Transmission ist ein großer Beton-Client. Ähm, gemacht. Da, das kann man auch dann relativ einfach in Transmission integrieren. Da fehlt nur jetzt noch, wenn man es eins zu eins übernimmt, ist die Key-Generierung, bevor die UI startet. Also das müsste man, wenn man es einbaut, noch etwas schöner machen, sodass das ganze Programm nicht blockiert. Die Implementierung müsste sich da aber nicht besonders schwer halten. Slide. Die, hier noch ein paar weitere Informationen. Als verwendete Kurve haben wir die, muss ich nachlesen, C2 PNB 176 Version 1 benutzt. Hier sieht man, dass es 176 Bit Breite ist. Damit kommen diese 16 Bit von vorher, der 2 KF. Und die restlichen 160 Bit bleiben dann. Ähm, den Source sieht man hier nochmal in groß. Ähm, zusammen gemacht haben, hat das René Treffer hier unten und ich, Leon von Tippskirch. Hier sind noch unsere E-Mail-Adressen und Twitter-Accounts. Und falls irgendjemand noch Fragen hat, kann er sich am besten jetzt schon mal anstellen. Und dann Slide. Jetzt kommt, kommt das Ganze, dass man das sagt, wie man das, wo sind die größten Lücken dahinter. Wenn man sagt, einen Key zu erzeugen, dauert eine Minute. Dann, um Keys zu erzeugen, die möglichst nah an der beschriebenen Eclipse Attack sind, braucht man Keys, die sehr viel näher sind als im Schnitt alle, die in der Kademlia sind. Das sind ungefähr 2 hoch 20 Schlüssel, womit man einen Core zwei Jahre auslasten könnte. Ist an sich nicht besonders viel. Man braucht dann noch ungefähr zehn nahegelegene Schlüssel. Das heißt, man ist ungefähr bei 20 Jahren. Das lässt sich oft lösen. Das heißt, man kann, wenn man ein Cluster hat, wenn man ein bisschen Geld auf Amazon wirft, kann man das mit 5.000 bis 10.000 Euro genügend Schlüssel erzeugen, um, einen, um die Eclipse Attack wieder zu machen, die vorher ohne, große, ohne Kosten zu erzeugen war. Auf der anderen Seite erzeugt man damit Schlüssel, die eindeutig sind und die danach verbrennen können. Das heißt, wenn, man, wenn der Node weiß, diese Schlüssel sind nicht gutartig, die announcen nicht weiter, verhalten sich nicht gutartig im Netzwerk, können sie geblacklistet werden oder Five minutes. Äh, rausgenommen werden. Und damit eröffnet man eben neue Möglichkeiten, die, wenn die frei wählbar sind, so nicht wären. Und das war es auch schon an größten Dingen von meiner Seite. Anscheinend rede ich zu schnell. Wenn noch irgendwelche Fragen offen sind, anscheinend nicht. Uh, Felix, did you want to, or did you want to take questions? I want. Yeah, did, you, you still have four minutes for questions if you'd like. Oh, he did. Okay, sorry. That was an unintentional joke. All right. I, th those are my favorite, the ones where I don't even know the jokes at my expense. Okay. And which is good, because now we're only one minute behind. Uh, uh. Yep. 
All good. Okay, your 15 minutes starts now. Okay, thanks, Nick. All right, I'm going to give a slightly extended talk of our uh, lightning talk of two days ago. Uh, my name is Ralph. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, Technische Universität München. I just realized, Nick, by the way, this is not the updated version of the slides, but I'm happy to uh, do it with these. <laughs> Unless you do um, have we, uh, yeah, the updated can, version. We can sort that out if you want. Sorry. It's, it's for your protection, not mine. <laughs> um, maybe just... Oh, today? Okay. latest one is from yesterday. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Where, where, do you know, where, where, where did you send them? All right. We'll do it in the old slides then. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry, I never received them, but uh, your 15 minutes is good now. Okay, cool. Um, now, again, researcher, technician, in München, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have been told... <laughs> yeah, that. Um, I have been told uh, last night that the difference between a researcher and someone who just uh, fiddles around with things is the writing up. I think I agree. Um, next slide, please. Right, my talk is about our crossbar tool, which is involved in SSL and SSH. Um, brief reminder, you have been told this numerous times, I believe. So, um, this is the X509 PKI, which is a hierarchy, and there are two remarkable issues here. One is there are chains of trust. Certificates can be used to uh, certify other entities, which can in turn again certify others. And there's one thing called a root store, which is uh, where your root certificates are stored, like in your Netscape browser, your Chrome browser, your Internet Explorer, if you like to use that, and, uh, or in your operating system. And here's one thing, all certification authorities are equal. Some may, maybe can be said to be more equal than others, but uh, one thing remains, if you break one certification authority, you have broken the whole system of X509 PKI, because any CA can issue for any domain or any entity. Slide, please. Now, have you ever seen this screenshot? Who has? Wow. 50% why I'm here. Um, right, this is the DigiNotar incident. This is the screenshot that was sent by a user in Iran, uh, lately in Iran, and this caused uh, the DigiNotar meltdown uh, and DigiNotar to go out of uh, business, a CA that was well hacked and uh, the Compromise cost about 500 certificates, rogue certificates for Mozilla, CIA, Mossad, and all the other nice uh, institutions to be issued. And it was only detected because Google Chrome had so far an undocumented feature, which is pinning. They had hard-coded their own certificate into their browser, and that's how this uh, compromise could be detected. DigiNota did not speak up of their own. Slide, please. And that got us thinking, what can we do to raise hard data this is not going to be uh, a talk about uh, strengthening X509. There are other, uh, other proposals for that. But what we are after is a tool to gather hard data so we can prove there are compromises of CAs or whatever. And we'd like to raise reliable data about men in the middle in the wild, answer questions like how often do they occur, where are the attackers located, who are they, if we can guess, or are we actually jumping at shadows and this doesn't happen very often at all. And uh, our idea is to combine two principles, uh, namely the notary principle and trace routing, and then do a centralized analysis. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, what's a notary principle? You've got uh, the user Alice, who's surfing the web or doing other stuff. Uh, slide. So she's now being man in the middle. She has an evil guy sitting on her first hop. Next slide, please. What Alice can do, however, is uh, if she has a little tool called Crossbear, ours, 
and she uh, has this SSL secured connection and with our server certificate hard coded into her software, she can actually query our own server, what do you see for this given destination slide? And our uh, host is happy to uh, fulfill her every wish and uh, check out this, uh, cheers, check out uh, the server and send her back a result slide. Exactly, so you get a report. And now we know there is a mismatch with what they see. Slide please. So what Alice can do now is uh, to help us out and start a trace route to the destination. Slide and send that as a report to us. And that's now useful because now we have hard data that something is on. Slide please. So what our server is going to do is it's, uh, it has a list of hunting tasks and it likes to distribute those. You can pull them from the server. And uh, we have a little user called Bob here who can download such a hunting task. Slide and go hunting, connect to the server, try out what certificate it sees, uh, he sees and uh, do a trace route and then report slide. So we get that. Now what we do need, next slide please, is to have many users. Many, many, like 100. And uh, what you really see is, have a look at the lower, uh, lower left corner, every Bob that has a green connection does not see a man in the middle. Every Bob that has a red connection sees a man in the middle. So if you are able to do intersection on the trace which you get, you have an idea where your attacker is located. Next slide, please. It's not quite that easy. Um, there's all kinds of network effects that you have to take into account and I cannot speak about many of these issues. So there's a research paper for that. But I'll tell you, we also determine some stuff on server side. Like we like to know what is the certificate authority that has issued the certificate. Is there a continuity or has the certificate authority changed? That will trigger a flag in our database. We also like to look up the autonomous systems of the uh, hosts in the trace route just to see how many autonomous systems occur more often than others. We do geolocation to a geo IP, find out which countries have been traversed by this uh, traffic. That's kind of interesting, right? And of course, we go after the who is. Now, how can you help us? Uh, our software, what you have seen so far, is available as a Firefox add-on. It's meant for savvy users, but that's you. And uh, it's not meant for your, for your, for your let's say, uh, less experienced parents, okay? Because they would be confused. But uh, if you know what to do and you know how to interpret what you see, that's uh, quite good. So you get a, a result from the Crossplay server that it does include all kinds of meta information about the connection. See the code on GitHub for that. Next slide, please. Now, the two attacker kinds that we are after. I'm only going to show you the attackers for which our concept works well. There are two more attackers for which it does not work too well. But uh, yeah, that's all the paper. Here's the attacker. It's a non-selective uh, attacker, so that he's going to man in the middle everyone. And in this case, he sits on the access point to which Alice is uh, connected. Next slide. And we're also looking at state level attackers. These are the guys who sit on border, border routers inspecting traffic leaving the country. Next slide, please. And um, for our concept, it's important to note that detection is easy, right? All you need is one report, and then you have detected a man in the middle attack and reported it. And all the attacker can do at this point is drop the connections to the Crossbar server, at which point our tool will actually attempt to send an email to us um, about this little fact. Um, localization is a lot harder. Um, you could, of course, say what you essentially need is at least one trace route from the victim and another one from unpoisoned hunter. The more, the better. The closer to the intersection point, the better, but the success depends on the numbers of hunters. And you can give an estimate, actually, about that. Next slide, please. So here's the curve. What you see is as long, look at the black curve on the, uh, on the, on the top, what you see is 100 hunters are enough, globally distributed are enough to have a very high success ratio to find the autonomous system where the attack is happening. But on the router level, it's pretty helpless. But that's okay for us, but uh, we are more interested in the autonomous system or if you can get it, the access point, right? Okay, next please. Now, a completely different protocol is SSH, but it uh, came to us as a little side project because we did a lot of SSH scans in the past three months. So sorry if we hit your SSH server, it's going to happen again. Um, yeah. So have you ever wanted to compare an SSH fingerprint 
in your uh, when you're connected to a to a new rented host maybe and you didn't have a second channel and you had no idea what the correct host key should be do you know many hosters who give you the uh, the host key fingerprint when you rent a server i don't think there's many um, there used to be a tool that uh, was called Prospectives that proposed to do this for SSH, but it's not maintained any anymore. So we thought, why, why not use our IPv4 wide scans plus our notary principle that we have already implemented for SSL and uh, do a notary for SSH as, as well. And that's the uh, domain name cbssh.net in tum.de. Next slide, please. So we have a proof of concept implementation, which is already on GitHub, but which we have not, um, not uh, we don't run it live for users at the moment because we do know that there are security issues with our software. So we don't want you to tamper with it uh, right now, although we are happy about bug reports, of course. So there's a patch for uh, OpenSSH. You can use this new option, verify host key notary, and then you just give, the, uh, give it a domain name, and it will use our notary to connect to your server, get the fingerprint, and report it back to you, and warn you on a mismatch, of course. We still have to implement the trace routing because that's a lot more difficult for uh, OpenSSH than it is uh, to do for a Firefox add-on. So if you don't want to no use our own notary, however, set up your own. It's all GPL. Next slide, please. And uh, from our IPv4 scans, we can give you this. Uh, we have stored our results, all the fingerprints and how often we have seen them. So just use a normal tool like dig and query the TXT record of your IP and put that as a subdomain under our own domain. domain. So for example, for this uh, IP address, you get uh, the fingerprint and that we have seen it for the first time on the 10th of February, uh, September 2012. But we have seen it twice since then, right? Um, I have used this during the Congress to find out my own fingerprint, which was useful to me. Right, next slide, please. Um, Five minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, scanning SSH is interesting, especially if you do it worldwide. And uh, I would like to give you a brief background on how you can do it and live. So slide, very important, get your own autonomous system. Slide, because Right? Your ISP is going to hate you if you try to do billions of connections. But if you have your own autonomous system, and we do, that's a lot easier. Slide? Yeah, that's important too. Have chocolate ready. Have chocolate ready for your administrator because he will hate you too, because he will get the reports that you are causing. Last time we had about 80,000 reports uh, sent to the Internet Storm Center, which is good. I mean, 3.5 billion uh, connections and only 80,000 reports. That's pretty good, I think. Don't do stateful tracking on your firewall, or be prepared to see your routers die. <laughs> our autonomous system is kind of offline at the moment because we scanned. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry to our admin at this point. <laughs> um, be prepared to get many complaints by mail. Write to certs. Next, please. R write to blacklist so they whitelist you. And uh, s tap twice, please. You can scan in five days with just one strong server. And yeah, you're going to make a lot of new friends because for <laughs> Yeah, 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 you do. Can you go to the next slide, please? These are new friends. <laughs> and I mean this, these guys are relaxed. Tap, please. That's a reply. When I wrote them back, they said, no problem. Feel thank for the reply. That's how relaxed these guys are. Actually, uh, can you? Yeah. Most reports we get are from academic institutions. They seem to be a bit touchy. Um, but if you offer to blacklist them, they say, oh, no, not necessarily, really. And we had only 10 reports in three scans over the months, only 10, uh, 10 occasions where people wanted to be blacklisted, and 50% of them were from private person. In one, in one instance, one guy had rented a virtual server and was really touchy about having received 20 packets from us. Hmm. <laughs> I found his Facebook and Twitter account. <laughs> so our position here, guys, we do not advertise our tool as a silver bullet. Certainly not. There's lots of stuff and network effects are really hard to get up with and the attacker can cope. It's really an arms race here and uh, we are in the unlucky position that we have to uh, come up with something new as soon as the attackers adapt to our, uh, to our methods. 
We do believe that we can get good results against one type of attacker, the non-selective attackers, but these are also the ones we're interested in. And uh, we're more or less deployed and ready. We have used, uh, we have standalone hunters on Planet Lab, and in our beta phase this year we had about uh, 4,000 certificate reports, but no man in the middle found. Slide, please. So, what's next? Um, I'm very grateful we have received a grant to implement a uh, cross pair for the Open Observatory of Network Interference, a TOR sub-project, which hopefully should get us many clients plus people in the right locations understanding what they do. And uh, that is where all our efforts will go in the next few months. And uh, we, of course, have to do a lot of automatic analysis. So, slide please. That's us. Uh, we are at, on Twitter. We are on the World Wide Web, but we're also on GitHub. So check out our software, write emails to us. We do know that the software is not complete. We're working on it, still working on it, and we do hope to have some good results very soon. I see I've got about one minute left, so I'm happy to take any questions, but that's all for me. Thanks. Um, just, I'll, I'll stop the clock, but wait for the uh, audio angel to get over to you so you can ask your question on the microphone. And for those of you exiting, let try to try to let our wonderful audio angel through. Are you collaborating your results uh, with the EFF ESSL Observatory? I didn't get it. Can you say it again, please? Are you coll correlating results with the EFF ESSL Observatory? Uh, Kind of. I have copies of the EFF. So the question was, do I correlate my results with the ESF, EFF observatory? Uh, I do not correlate results on man in the middle reports because as far as I know, that data is still within the EFF and not public. I do have their scans and uh, we do have one large analysis server where we do correlate results between our own scans and theirs. So that's half a yes and half a no. But I'm happy to do it as soon as that data gets public. Uh, do you have currently uh, a method to detect uh, wrong uh, reports, for example, if the attacker uses your tool um, to uh, report many uh, wrong uh, sites, or yeah. if, if the attacker sees that your tool uh, detected him, he wanted to mis give misleading information, so you think he will be um, somewhere else? Okay, wonderful question, thanks. The question is, do we have any measures to mitigate an attacker who's trying uh, to send us fake reports? That's a difficult question. The, uh, one short answer is, we have one little trick. We force anyone who wants to report to do a full TCP handshake with us, citing a token that our server knows. So you cannot spoof an IP address arbitrarily. You have to have control over the system or any system downstream that forces the attacker uh, to yeah, limit himself to a system he controls. What we cannot do is uh, cope with attackers who are trying to send, if they can spoof the IP address, reports from that. That's analysis. We need to do clustering here and find out if there's a suspicious number of reports coming from distant, uh, certain systems or from uh, certain paths. We do have BGP data. We know plausible traces. We know plausible paths in the internet. So we can check that. That's a lot of hard work and uh, it does become manual work. Okay? So yes, there are some measures in place, but well, it's the internet. They can never be complete, and the attacker is always one step ahead of us. If he really wants to drop our connections, he can do so. We have thought about fallback to email and fax. And that's your time. Uh, warm round of applause. Thanks. And then, Matt, I saw you walk in. Uh, and if I could just quickly get you to come over here. I've, I've been holding on to this for you since tour camp, and I thought now I should finally get rid of it so I don't get harassed by security for it on the way back. You're pretending that I can take this on a plane. Well, it's, it's your problem now. I brought toys. <laughs> although, although if it makes you feel any better, I managed to fly here with that. Yeah. So you should be okay. 
Uh, all right, you almost ready to go? Yeah, just one more thing. Um, are you going to be holding those up? Should we prepare the cameras to, to look yeah, for those? Yeah, I'm going to be holding those up in a bit. OK. All right, look, stuff, things. Good morning, hackers. <laughs> um, I consider it OK that my talk is going to be punctuated by the sound of dropped bottles. It's just a fact of the motto. Uh, uh, Matt, could you just hold, could you hold up one of the things you're going to be holding up so they can uh, just try to get Make, make an attempt at getting a close-up of it. <laughs> uh, is, that, is that the best camera position you can get for, for holding his? Uh... <laughs> I, I guess that's about as good as we're going to get. So are you ready to proceed? Yeah. OK, go. Ruby. So I'm Matthew Borgetti. Uh, I do a, wear a bunch of different hats. Um, one of them is industrial designer, worked on a whole bunch of projects doing different kind of industrial materials design for places like fusion brands, which make a lot of silicone bakeware. I used to work in the special effects industry, which had me playing with a lot of animatronics and a lot of material science. And I recently started doing stuff with universities and robotics projects and thought that I could bring something interesting to the field of robotics, including opening the source and opening the methods on soft robotics. Completely pneumatic, or doesn't have to be pneumatic, but my designs are pneumatic, no hard parts required, cast silicone robots that are powered by air. Slide. So here's kind of the state of the art right now. Um, the Whitesides group has this thing that you might have seen before. It's a DARPA-funded project that is a little kind of walking crab starfish design. It's it. it a cast silicone object with another silicone sheet adhered to the top of it that has a bunch of channels running through it that cause it to inflate. Um, and this is actually uh, another project from the Whitesides lab slapped on top of it um, that's a microfluidics project, so it's essentially a robot sandwich. And uh, on the upper right, you have a robot from, I think, about 10 years ago. The Tufts ATL lab designed this uh, caterpillar. And the Caterpillar is actually controlled by night and all wire, so there are hard, uh, incredibly hot wires inside of this. And the robot you see on the bottom is done by Festo Labs, um, which do, does a lot of pretty and innovative robotics, but this thing is also controlled by a number of hard cables. These are, these are kind of inflexible skeletal elements that are at the core of a lot of these robots, and I think limit them in terms of their softness, organicness, and mimicry of nature. Next. So what the heck is a soft robot good for? Um, this is a project from the Mediated uh, Matter Lab at MIT. Uh, these are printed uh, cuffs for alleviating carpal tunnel. Everybody's hands are a bit different. Everybody's carpal tunnel is a bit different. And a lot of the therapies for carpal tunnel involve limiting your axes of motion on the hand and also reducing the pressure to your wrists. But the idea is that with an individual person's flexibility, with an individual person's range of motion, their pain points, you can actually design something backwards from those specifications to design a brace that works for them. And the kind of things I'm thinking about is there are people who have strokes. They actually they have these assistive devices in therapy to get them, to encourage them to use the damaged arm. So oftentimes in a stroke, you'll have damage to a part of the mortocortex and the somatosensory cortex, and you'll end up having somebody whose arm doesn't work the way they want it to. And one of the therapies for this is to actually attach robotic controls to their arm to give them that last little bit of oomph. Because if they don't use the damaged limb, they actually don't regrow a pattern of neurons to move around the damaged areas. It can be done. Neuroplasticity lasts your whole life. But it takes very, very diligent therapy. And I'm thinking, well, why not a soft, wearable cuff that you could inflate to give that level of robotic control that you could wear under any clothing without motors, without batteries? So those are the kinds of things I'm thinking of. Next. So where the heck are the soft robots in the market? Why isn't there a soft robot you can buy? And my particular analysis on this, my take on this, is that the prototyping methods haven't gotten good enough that we can come up with reliable, cheap, iterative designs where we can start with some experiments in the lab and move on to something that eventually essentially predicts its own methods. In industrial design, you have this, where you 3D print your models, you 3D print your cell phones, and you test out the interface. You test little designs. You say, this isn't very good in my hand. This doesn't last very long if I drop it. And you can iteratively design that way. Soft robots in the lab right now are very, very time consuming and very, very expensive. And I'm trying to reduce that. Next. 
So I want to get, the, here are kind of my main points that I'm trying to solve with this project. I've got a lot of other things I'm trying to play with, but these are like the big brush strokes. I want to find a generalized method that with the same techniques you can make a whole lot of different robots. Um, I want to get arbitrary geometry inside a seamless skin. Essentially a seamless skin, no seams, no place for the human error to come into play and wreck things. I want to get arbitrary geometry as in if I need a robot that's like a tentacle and it has a right hand curve somewhere in the middle of it, I can actually design the geometry inside of that around the needs, not have the limitations of the fabrication method limit the kinds of robots I I can have. So I want the prototyping to be inexpensive. I want them quick and variable so that I can easily change different designs on the fly. And I want them easy to reproduce. I want that if I have a successful looking design, I can make a whole bunch of, to put, of them to put them through, through trials. Because a good robot stands up to a lot of environments. And this is one of my core beliefs at the bottom here. This is one of my core beliefs about um, universities. Uh, grad student labor is slave labor and cannot be reproduced in the market. If your thing takes 100 grad student hours to put together, it's probably not a marketable product. Next. So here's what I'm doing. Um, I'm working with a company called Viridis that's doing my 3D printing. Viridis was founded by Jim Brett, who is one of the core founders of uh, Z Corp, which is a 3D powder printing company. And I'm here, what I'm doing is I'm making 3D powder printed molds um, that involve soluble cores. So the outside of the robot mold is made of plastic. The inside of the robot mold is made of wax or a soluble material like cornstarch. I'm using parametric CAD to do this so that I can change variables. When something doesn't work, I can roll back in the method and be like, this needs to be more densely filled, or the wall thickness needs to change. So I can quickly change my designs to fit my needs, and then I'm trying to have it be minimal, minimal manual fabrication. I have robots. I have robots that print things for me. Why would I design things that still take up my human time? I can have robots do that for me. Next. So. This is a functioning robotic tentacle. So what happens here is, yeah. So there's a structured hollow volume inside of here that as I pump it up, the volume deforms because of the air pressure. So there's a manifold right down the middle and one of these on either side. Bloop. This is a similar model, not hooked up to pneumatic control, but it's a trefoil, three of those volumes on the inside. It should be able to do a full 360. I just got this out of the mold right before CCC, so I haven't had a chance to test this one yet. But next, next, oh yeah, I, I'm sorry too. Um, next slide. So here's the method for the conical tentacle. So we start out with a hard printed outer mold. This is made out of a material called maker dust. This is a material engineered by Jim Brett um, for Veritas, um, but it prints out on a regular th uh, Z Corp printer. Um, additionally, uh, the Z Corp printer doesn't need any special adhesives or anything for this, and uh, Z Corps are powered by a standard HP inkjet head. Just in case you were wondering about how magical the uh, 3D printing is, they squirt liquid out of a inkjet head. That's, that's the magic. So next. So here's the core. Here's the uh, cornstarch core I was talking about, printed cornstarch. It's, it's not a terribly complicated material. Um, it is a little bit on the fragile end. It is a little bit on the brittle end. We've moved away from this particular method. It was really, really plausible because the idea was, well, all you have to do is soak the tentacle in water and eventually you have uh, working skin. That doesn't work so very well because you get to something um, I like to call the lumpy pancake problem which is you have uh, a little bit of the silicone soak into the cornstarch and it doesn't quite become silicone and it doesn't quite stay cornstarch. It becomes, like if you've ever had a lumpy pancake, you have like a layer of goo on the outside and then there's like a dry flour lump on the inside. That, that's what happens. Next one. So here is one, the core placed inside of the shell and silicone being cast in the seam between them and that's as complicated as it gets. That's, that's just, my, my time assembling this project was just waxing the two sides of the plastic mold and then putting in the core and the silicone. It's, it's a very, very rapid iteration process. Next slide. So here's a, that experiment working. Um, next slide. So what, what went wrong with that one? Well, um, 
So the, the materials design is actually really important with this. The kind of silicone that you choose is actually very important. I, I started out using a silicone that I just had on hand because I had it on hand. Um, I do a lot of um, prototyping for companies at, at my own company, Sleek and Destroy. And I, I have a lot of silicones on hand. That's just part of, part of my gig. And so I, I used a cheap one uh, that doesn't have the kind of stretch, that doesn't kind of have the kind of elasticity that I needed. But there are solutions for this. The world is full of silicones. So um, I already talked about the lumpy pancake thing. The wall thickness, it's, it was important to come up with a method where I could guarantee that the cores I had lined up in the mold um, so that they wouldn't deviate and change the wall thickness. Because when you change the wall thickness on these robots, they actually change the way they move because the wall thickness is part of the pneumatic actuator. And adhesives were important. Um, I actually found a uh, thing called Silpoxy that ended up working perfectly to seal um, silicone to silicone. Next. So yes, uh, we made some improvements, we made some changes. Uh, Moldmax and Dragonskin, those are the two silicones um, provided by SmoothOn, smooth-on.com, um, that work marvelously for this process. Um, next. Five minutes. Yay. So here is the new method, it is a wax core, next slide. So here's Jim Brett pouring up a, uh, a new tentacle. Next slide. And here's that coming out of the mold. So wax, the, the wax is easy to produce. It's easy to find. It's easy to manufacture little flat waxes um, because we're using 3D printed molding. And so all, all that happens is we cast the silicone in and melt the wax out. Next slide. OK, more complicated things. This thing right here. So more complicated stuff. This. Yeah. So what do we got? is an outer mold here that's actually three copies of the exact same part. And then the inner core is made, ugh, almost lost it, made with this flat mold. These things, although it looks kind of complicated, these things are really easy to produce because if I design the tentacle that I want, I can roll back the method and print on the 3D printer all the stuff to make it too. This is a mold to create the cores. Next, could I have the next slide? So that's a 3D printed mold that makes this thing. Next slide. So it makes this. Next slide. I cast wax in it. Next slide. And it gets me a core. Next slide. I assemble that. Next slide. With a little jig that I, I made laser cut. Next slide. And I put it in the mold. All of this stuff I can make easy multiples of. So if I want to have 100 tentacles casting at the same time, say I need 100 legs for something, it's actually really easy for me to just go along the line and pour into all of these molds and have the printer printing more as I'm doing it. Next slide. And so that's what comes out. Next slide. So there's the bottom. You can see the trefoil shape and the little shadows of the way it was cast. Next slide. So what's next? Next slide. Well, I've got a quadruped that's coming out that should be done by the end of January. It should walk with only two airlines, as in one airline causes it to do a left-hand walk and one does a right-hand walk, essentially how a gecko walks up the walls, touching each side of its feet together. So you have left side walk, right side walk. Next slide. So I need your help to push it further. Because I do the mechanical engineering, I do the industrial design, but I think to make it truly open source, because the idea is to get other people doing this, not to just be like, I have a lab and 3D printers, everybody look at me. The, the whole point is actually to create a better ecosystem for soft robots, because I think they're a really cool technology that needs to be pushed further, and one person in a lab probably isn't going to do it. It's going to be a lot of people playing with a lot of experiments. So I need to bring it to a prototyping level where you don't have to have my specific experience in CAD to use my files and learn from my designs. You know, I've been using like SolidWorks for 10 years. I know SolidWorks pretty well. I shouldn't say, here, use my files. But first, go to design school, drop out of design school, we'll go back to design school, then start working for a special effects industry. That, that shouldn't be the limitation here. So, Fast iteration speed, and I need a computational solution. Next slide. Um, I think that, that you need that to keep this source open. I can give you my STLs. You can print those on your own. You, you can print my 3D files, but that's kind of limited. I would rather, I mean, I'm going to give out my 3D files. I have a profile on Thingiverse. My username is giant I. Um, I need to document all the things I've been putting up on it, but there are Thingiverse files. Um, 
keeping it open is more having you be able to replicate my success, not replicate my specific results. Next slide. OpenSCAD is not an option. So if you, if you do an image search on OpenSCAD, people have been suggesting OpenSCAD. Um, it doesn't have the kind of robust parametric control that I think I need. I think I need, next slide. Uh, libraries and processing, the, like the work of Nervous System and Marius Watts, they have been able to use One computational, minute. thank you, they've been use, able to use computational design to develop growth patterns that fit certain constraints. And I think that a hollow tentacle populated by a growth pattern that fits certain constraints is perfect. I think you, what you would end up looking for is like bone ingrifation, um, ingrifation, I mean, there's a name for it. The patterns inside of bones or the patterns inside of corals, those are algorithmic based growth patterns. The cells individually are seconds. doing, yes, next. So, I'm not alone in this process. I'd like to thank Jim Brett and Veritas3D for helping me out with the engineering and partially funding this project and Amanda Wozniak for offering amazing advice. So next. I'm Matthew Bugatti, my site is Harms, and my Twitter handle is GiantEye. Look at my site for all the source and the methods on the robots, and thank you very much. If you want to see these in person, I'll be in the hardware hacking area. All right, oh, check, check. That was the 15-minute uh, round. Uh, thank you again to all the presenters. And we're running five minutes behind. I think we might be missing one presentation. But we're just going to go ahead and launch into the regular five-minute lightning talks now. Um, so uh, just, a couple of, just a couple of reminders for people who are giving five-minute lightning talks. Don't forget to always talk into the microphone, because if you wander away from it a little bit, then people don't really understand <coughs> what you're saying. And especially the people on the streams will have no idea at all what you're saying. Um, usually, we're, I think we're going to just say no questions and answers for the five-minute lightning talk round, since we're running behind. Um, so even if you finish early, that's, that's good. Thank you so much. Quick round of applause for the audio angel who is managing that chaos. <laughs> and are you good? Yeah. Five minutes uh, starts now. Okay, uh, I will be holding up books, so uh, maybe you can focus the camera on me because I don't have slides. Yeah, uh, my name is Dem Unterstrich Fred and my topic is the relation between intellectual property right and science fiction. I want to share a few thoughts and uh, maybe you're interested to contribute. Uh, my contact is in the wiki or message me on Twitter. Uh, so now a really fast lecture. Uh, as my lame pun in the background tells, uh, intellectual property right never played a famous role in older science fiction. Knowledge was always free. The main conflicts are of a different kind. But as IPR became a problem in the present, authors became aware and started to think of it as a thing suitable for their own stories. Uh, my starting point is the obvious one. In 1984, William Gibson published The Neuromancer, a novel famous for many things. For one, it was uh, there where the, term, uh, where the term cyberspace was invented, Gibson being the only one who can still use it without irony. Uh, also, some of the best contemporary English prose. Uh, besides this, it is in the exposition where intellectual property rights suddenly appears. Knowledge is given to an Ill illegal clinic by an AI named Wintermute. Yes, we have passed the singularity now, which leads to application of patterns and some people become incredibly, uh, incredibly rich. Everything okay. The next one, a classic two. In 1995, Neil Stevenson published The Diamond Age, a novel about the past, namely the Victorian age, becoming a part of a future in which nanotechnology is dominating, making everything easily reproducible, just like we hope it would come. But there's blood in the water. There's a low class of outcasts who can only replicate the basic goods to survive, everything else being copyrighted and protected through IPR. And so it begins. 2005, Paolo Bajigalupi publishes a series of short stories in a collection named uh, Pump 6, featuring a world uh, which is devastated through engineered diseases and famines which were produced by global companies to create food monopoles. These companies sell plant seeds to a starving humanity which lacks the ability to produce new seeds and are protected by IPR. Do you see who was the role model for this? <coughs> Monsanto. Um, in 2009, Bajigalupi publishes The Wind-Up Girl with the terrible German title, Biokrieg. 
which continues this universe. Um, 2009, Cory Doktorow, which we all know, publishes his novel Makers under CC license, free to download, just so you know. It is dedicated, and I want to quote it here, for the risk takers, the doers, the makers of things. Uh, it features a near future in which a large corporation, Kodakfa, struggles to survive and relies on a new business model featuring you, the makers. It is a world where fabbers, 3D printers are common technology and most everyday goods can be fabbed, including AK-47s, but not yet the bullets. Um, what was it a few weeks ago? Uh, someone fired six shots from a, a fabbed gun. Uh, foreshadowing anyone? Um, and now uh, the last one, which I unfortunately don't have here. It's Michael Scalzi's Old Man's War. Once again, a terrible German title, Krieg der Klone. Why uh, can't we get this right? It is said uh, to be the new Starship Troopers, and it features a future in which humanity is in a deadlock conflict with all other species in the galaxy. A war fought by old people, their consciousness put into new enhanced military bodies, making them relatively immortal. But once they have done their military duty, they need to give these bodies away because the technology is protected as intellectual property of the military of mankind. Oh, the pains. Um, so what's the point? Uh, many of these novels won awards, including Hugo and Nebula, not only because these books are good entertaining sci-fi literature, which I wanted to share with you, but because the authors care to not only make their invented futures believable, but a plausible continuation of the ideas that are already part of our world. Uh, what's my message? All these novels feature uh, concepts of intellectual property rights similar to already existing ones. And like in the present, they make the future much more boring than it should be. Science fiction, and I need to repeat this again, is not meant as an instruction manual. It is the exploration of future possibilities and sometimes it is meant as a warning. Intellectual property right has to change, we have to force it, 3D printing has to stay free, science fiction seconds. will get even more awesome. Thank you. All good? Okay, we're running a little bit behind, so we're just gonna jump right into it. Your five minutes starts now. Good morning, my name is David Fifield. I am a member of the Tor Project, and I'm the primary developer of the Flash Proxy Censorship Circumvention System. <laughs> and my name is Brian Dugan. I work at the Open Technology Institute in Washington, D.C., and I am a recent Flash Proxy volunteer. So, <laughs> Uh, first of all, about the name, uh, we do not use Adobe Flash. <laughs> uh, we actually use JavaScript, and I'll explain kind of how the whole system works, and then Brian will tell you some more about a special system using Flash Proxy. So the problem we're trying to solve is internet censorship. In a lot of countries, people want access to Tor in order to uh, read the free internet. But the problem is, in a lot of countries, access to Tor relays is blocked by IP address. How do we get around this? Well, our solution is to use a network of miniature temporary proxies that run in web browsers as a JavaScript program. There are some limitations with writing network applications inside of a browser. Namely, when you're using WebSocket, you can't, wit you can't listen for connections as you would with a normal proxy. So instead, we invert the usual proxy model. We have the proxy connect to the client. That imposes some difficulties, but I'll explain how that works. Next slide, please. First of all, the client has to advertise its willingness to the outside world to receive a connection. I'm a censored client, please come help me. Now this step is a bit tricky. You see here, this is a message going through the firewall. So clearly this can't just be a direct, straightforward connection. This problem is tricky, but not, imp not impossible to solve, and we actually have an implementation of this uh, process happening. If you wanna talk to me afterward, I can explain how we make this work. Next slide, please. At this point, a flash proxy comes online. What this means is they open up a web browser to a web page that has this JavaScript programming, this program running on it. Uh, the flash proxy asks the facilitator, which is a network of uh, database of client addresses, do you have any censored clients to give to me? Slide, please. 
The facilitator says, yes, here is your client, slide please. At this point, the flash proxy makes a connection to the censored client. Now this is another line that's going through the firewall. The reason we believe this line is less likely to be blocked is that this is a random web browser. This connection is coming from a random IP address which is not going to be on any censor, on any censor's blacklist. Next slide please. And finally, the proxy makes a connection to a Tor relay and simply starts copying bytes back and forth. And you're on Tor. So there are a few uh, issues with uh, some of the resources available on, on, the, on the screen. So uh, the most limited resource is the flash proxy itself. Right now, there are maybe five websites in the entire world that actually host the, web, the flash proxy JavaScript. And there are maybe as many users, I think last check was 57 users, who actually have visited those websites and keep their tab open and, and perform as relays for, uh, for the clients. So how, do, how can we maximize maximize the, uh, uh, the popularity of running a flash proxy. We could use platforms that, uh, that are already popular and build in the flash proxy, for example, into a Facebook application. So what if we had a Facebook application that, uh, that used the, the, the uh, uh, that could make it available to Facebook users, what could we do with that? We could have a persistent store of the number of bits that you've proxied from the client to the Tor network. You could rank and rate users against each other and make it a social experience for better or worse. But I think that the, the social intervention here is uh, using, exploiting the most privacy invasive network on the face of the planet to provide uh, privacy and anonymity to, uh, to people who actually need it. The <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there, uh, so not only does it make the experience social, but it can also be an activist platform, uh, providing a you know uh, we could push out news events and and updates about uh, the state of privacy in the world to people who are actively giving up their privacy on Facebook every single day. Um, so uh, this is a project that uh, that we, we're looking to start right now. Both David and I uh, need volunteers for the uh, Facebook application and for Flash Proxy proper. Um, so if you are a Facebook developer. Uh, JavaScript developer, uh, we would both love to, to talk to you. So um, yeah, very excited and thank you very much. You that slide. The slide. Be excellent to one another. Actually, I, I didn't get the latest version, so do you want to try plugging in your... Um, do you, have, you don't have the latest version? I, yeah. I summon you. Everyone now knows my number. So, okay guys.
Good to start with some entertainment, right? Okay, your five minutes starts now. Okay. Um, my name is Helge Stettler. I'm from the Assembly of OpenStreetMap, and I want to tell you today something about OpenCMap, which is about navigation on the sea, and especially OpenCMap AR. Um, we have an OpenCMap app right now on the App Store, which looks like this, which is for iPhone and iPod. And please uh, have a look at uh, this small images. Uh, so pretty, pretty small signs of navigation, for example, lighthouses. Just keep that in mind. Uh, we also have an iPad app for that, and which, is, which just gives you more space. And um, it's pretty successful, though it's ranking on place 100 and something. We started last January with uh, providing the app to the public. Until now, we had uh, roughly 20,000 uh, downloads, and um, yeah, it was mentioned in several publications. And we have by now uh, 100 downloads per day. Um, this is uh, the downloads over since we started with the application. And as you see, it's roughly 3,000 in a month. Uh, the green area is basically where people are boating on the sea, and in the red area, it's not good to have your boat in the sea because it's winter. So during the season is actually the relevant uh, time where you use that. Um, there were some problems with this app because, um, as I have shown you, um, these very small signs for navigation are not really um, practical if you're navigating and if you have to orient yourself quickly on the boat. You have uh, different lighting conditions and everything goes like this and uh, it's difficult to see them and recognize them. So, and also you have to have all these uh, graphics data as tiles to download up front before you go to the sea because you do not have any internet there. So, I imagine something like perhaps augmented reality thing which helps you orient yourself much quicker. And um, yeah, if you have good weather, that's no problem usually. But if you have bad weather and bad sight, it quickly becomes a problem that you do not know where you are. So if you're, for example, in a foggy situation, um, then you do not recognize anything and you can see only 20 meters. So why not use the smartphone you carry with you? You have a compass, a gyroscope, you have GPS, and you have, in best case, a, a database carrying a lot of information about all the CMARC sites. Yeah, just turn on your superpower. And CMARC site with augmented reality might come in handy here. Just a quick comparison. For example, Superman has X-ray vision. You can just realize that. Um, you have the CMARC database from OpenStreetMap. You have GPS and you have a camera. You can just project it into it. And then you can see through the fog. You have heat vision. You can use the database for weather and combine that with your map. You have even Zoom and every other stuff. OK, we fail on solar eye laser, but I think that's OK kind of peaceful use. Um, what's next? Yeah, basically you usually orient yourself to this stuff, but you cannot easily recognize that. Um, even if it's day, it's uh, difficult to recognize because it's usually far away. And it's good to say fa stay far away from that because it's secure then. And if it's foggy, you do not see anything of that. So that's a problem. Why not turn that into this? For example, display symbols for these items on a screen. And that's what I want to show you here. This is kind of a mock-up prototype how that might look like. So you see the landmarks just on the display and projected into the camera view as augmentation. Yeah, you can see, for example, the lighthouse then, and which is very important because you have to stay away from, from lighthouses. They are usually on the land, and you do not want to go on the land. And um, you usually need the red and the green buoys for, to find, for example, the entrance to, a, to an harbor. And yeah, you usually also do not want to go onto land with your boat. So that's basically something I want to do. Uh, also displaying the distance you have uh, to a certain stuff. And yeah, what does it now do? It does not uh, need the, the clumsy map files, which also lose all semantic information. You do not need all that data. You just uh, download once the XML data from the Open, data, open Street Map database uh, and use your GPS compass, what you have on your smartphone. 30 yeah. seconds. Yes. And um, this is something I want to build. 
So it's an augmented reality renderer, uh, a small engine on the mobile phone which just uses the XML data from the OpenStreetMap database or the CMARC data um, and projects that stuff. So if you want to help code, just contact me. I'm also known as Trailblazer. And yeah. <laughs> And I will change my number code now. <laughs> um, okay, we have a, uh, I think we, if we can just take a quick five minute break so I can catch up with all of the presenters uh, that are coming up next. If you have a presentation and you have not yet submitted your slides uh, or you need to talk to me about something, please come up. Other than that, we'll see you back in five minutes.
Okay, and we are back. <coughs> not, not quite as smooth as yesterday, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we try to run all the slides off a common laptop so we can just go boom, 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 boom. And without any further ado, are you ready? Yeah. Five minutes starts now. Ich heiße euch herzlich willkommen zu meinem Lightning Talk. Wie ihr schon mitbekommen habt, der Vortrag ist in Deutsch. Mein Vortrag halt geht über die Auswirkungen der morphogenischen Felder auf die elektronische Umgebung. Dieser Begriff morphogenisches Feld ist in den 80er Jahren entstanden durch den britischen Biologen Rupert Sheldrake, der damals ein Gedankenmodell aufgestellt hat, wo es darum geht, dass Wissen, Information in ein Feld gesammelt wird. Er hat es an verschiedenen Beobachtungen damals angefangen wissenschaftlich zu erarbeiten. Die Hypothese von ihm wurde aber noch in der jetzigen Wissenschaft noch nicht anerkannt. Aber es gibt zum Beispiel das bekannteste Phänomen dieser morphischen Felder kommt aus Großbritannien, wo die Milch, 
wo die Milchflaschen mit einem Aluminiumdeckel vor dem Zweiten Weltkrieg ausgeliefert wurden. Und eine bestimmte Blaumeisenart hatte damals eine Technik entwickelt, um diese Deckeln zu öffnen, um an die Milch heranzukommen. Während des Zweiten Weltkrieges dann wurden diese, die Milch wieder anders verpackt in Plastiktüten. Nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg stieg man wieder von der Produktion um auf diese Milchflaschen mit Aluminiumdeckel. Und das Interessante, was beobachtet wurde, ist, dass in ganz Großbritannien alle Meisen in kürzester Zeit diese gleiche Technik wieder anwandten, um diese, an diese Milch heranzukommen. Und bekannt ist in der Wissenschaft, dass diese Meisen zum Beispiel einen ganz kleinen Radius haben, an Aktionsreichweite, wo, wo sie hin können. Somit war es unmöglich, dass dieses Wissen durch, auch durch die Zeit, die vergangen ist, unmöglich diesen Meisen direkt beizubringen. Also musste irgendetwas da sein, dass dieses Wissen den Meisen danach vermittelt wurde. Um damit mal auf einen Schritt weiter zu gehen in unsere Richtung, wo ich hin möchte, auf die elektronische Umgebung. Also es muss anscheinend irgendein Feld oder ein Wissensfeld da sein, was in der Wissenschaft schon äh, seit mehreren Jahren diskutiert wird und erforscht wird, wo es darum geht, dass sich eine Information, ein Gedanke verbreiten kann. Und wenn ich das jetzt in unseren Raum hier umlege, dann ist es eine Art Information, die entsteht, eine Art Möglichkeit, die einen Raum gibt für spezielles Wissen. Wie vielleicht manche von euch mitbekommen haben, ist das Erlangen von Wissen eine Fähig oder eine Prozedur, wo es immer darum geht, Wiederholungen zu machen, bis man das sich eingeleibt hat. Aber auch gewisse Fähigkeiten, wie zum Beispiel, wie es wir haben mit der Zuckerwarte, diese Zuckerwarte auf diese Stab drauf zu bringen, erfordert eine gewisse Art von Geschicklichkeit. Und ich gehe davon jetzt mal aus, dass es sich hier in diesem Kongress ein Feld gebildet hat. In diesem Feld drinnen sammeln sich sozusagen Informationen darüber, über die verschiedenen Techniken, über Fähigkeiten wie Zuckerwarte zu erstellen oder auch ganz äh, banal die Möglichkeit, einen Raum zu geben, um einfach nochmal ein Kind zu sein, so wie es sich gestern ereignet hat, wo die, äh, diesen Bällebad, diese Kunststoffbällebad, ähm, gestern sehr spontan sich eine, ein, ein Spiel entwickelt hat, wo man sich halt gegenseitig abschießt, aber es war sehr faszinierend zu beobachten, weil das ohne dass es jemand mitgeteilt wurde, dort, dort Leute angezogen worden, die einfach mitgemacht haben, mitgemacht haben, ohne dass man sie davor überzeugt hatte. One einfach, minute. Weil diese, sag ich mal, dieses, dieses Feld einfach da war, um diese Möglichkeit, diese Möglichkeit da war, dort mitzumachen. Gut, was kann man jetzt machen in der elektronischen Umgebung? Ich gehe davon aus, dass jetzt dieses Wissensfeld ist auch damit drinnen, verankert ist, dass ich daran glaube, dass ich daran weiß, wie der Computer funktioniert und anhand dessen, dass ich das weiß, funktioniert dieser Computer genau nach meinen Richtlinien. Für Leute, die das, dieses Feld nicht beiwohnen, fun funktioniert dieses, dieser Computer vielleicht auch teilweise schlechter oder hat mehrere Bugs. Und meine Forschung, so ich so vorsichtig sagen möchte, oder meine Beobachtung geht in dieser Hinsicht, was wie stark beeinflusst, beeinflusst unser eigenes Wissen, unser eigenes Feld, die elektronische Umgebung. Vielen Dank für eure Aufmerksamkeit. Hallo, mein Name ist Nils Lohmann und ich arbeite at der uh, University of Rostock und da machen wir Research on Compilers. Und in meiner freien Zeit habe ich ein bisschen obsessed about languages und ich wollte talk über ein Projekt sprechen, das ich in den letzten Jahren gemacht habe. Slide. So, wenn you look at computer languages, you can very easily can be obsessed about how the style of the program is. So, when you look on the, on the left, you see that it's a very redundant piece of code that could be replaced by a simple free call. And um, when you're very nerdy about it, you could start arguing where the braces should go, should the braces of an if be in the same line, or should there be a new line. And if you look at the right, you can have the same arguments, and there the code is not even redundant, it's also wrong. So it passes the compiler, but then it breaks at runtime. And that is something where at computer science, we have some tools to 
it'll have some limited ideas how to detect these bugs and how to fix these bugs. Slide. On the other hand, we have the English language, which is used in computer sciences uh, for everything we write down. And as a non-native speaker, you start using your English skills from school and you start writing down research papers. And you fail miserably because you try to sound very smart and you use a lot of words. But these a lot of words don't make you feel uh, make uh, make it smart. It just makes it embarrassing. And then you have some words or some things you think that is a sentence, and in the end you can replace it by a single word. Um, you try to have a lot of um, you have some informal languages, and this is all nothing you want to see in a research paper uh, slide. So when you write down your papers and you give it to your, your um, supervisor, you get it back and the whole margin is written down with corrections. And what you actually want to have, you want to have some warnings like in a, comp uh, like in a compiler, which just tells you, well, in, in line six, you used uh, a, st uh, a stupid word. You should replace it by another word that doesn't make it look too stupid. Slide. And we have an app for that. This app is called Nitpicker. Uh, you can use it online. You uh, enter uh, some, some text you wrote. You press a button. And in best case, it detects some, some stupid errors that pass the style, uh, the, 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 um, the type checker, but it, it's still semantically not, not correct. So you have some drop downs and you can, can replace um, stupid words by more clever words. Slide. And the current state of the project is that we implemented some style guides that you can uh, get in the library, so the Chicago Manual of Style and uh, a nice book for Alain Dupre called Bucks in Writing and other style guides. And it finds some current errors or style, style errors that you don't want to have in your text and some wrong prepositions. Um, we have a web app currently and we, it's based on a JSON API which is not yet a public slide. Um, apparently there are some challenges. First being that English is not context-free, so we can't use standard compilers, write uh, a grammar and push a button. We have a lot of false positives, because if you use some words in one context, it might be nice, in another context, it might be wrong. So there are some, for instance, some rules that say you shouldn't use the word information too often, because it's, it's a non-word, it doesn't mean too much. But if you are in information sciences, apparently use the word a lot. Um, good style is very subjective, so coming from computer science, I implemented a lot of style guides for computer science. If you're doing physics or mathematics, it might be that computer sciences have a whole different kind of style. And I'm not a native speaker, which makes it even more complicated to, to implement something clever, but it helps a lot because I can start avoid errors I do again and again. Slide. So what I want is I want help. Um, I need a lot of people to use it. So I had, uh, up to now I used it in some computer science papers, got some feedback about it, but I, needed, I need more people using it. So I need more people telling me what is wrong or more people telling me um, about other style guides. Um, I need people who actually know about, a bit more about natural language. I need a good part of speech tagger. I know there's some around, but they're not like branch on GitHub and you can use it. Um, what would be nice to have some integrators so that in the end you have your paper written in LaTeX, you press a button and you One have minute. annotated LaTeX. Um, I need language nerds which like fiddling around with languages as much as I do, so I basically need you and your friends and your friends of friends. Um, on the bottom line you see an email address where you can send me an email whether you'd like to participate. On the bottom right you have the URL of the web app and you can follow me on Twitter and thanks a lot. And one quick reminder, and if you could also uh, tell your friends, this applies throughout the conference. Um, on the FAR plan, uh, where the schedule for the main lectures are, there's always a link there to leave feedback. Um, we're looking forward to seeing what you thought about all of the lectures uh, and the lightning talks especially. So if you could go there, leave feedback, positive or negative, any suggestions for improvement or things that you really liked and you'd like to see again next year, that would be much appreciated. So without any further ado, are you ready?
Your five minutes starts now. Hi, uh, next slide, please. I'm uh, Mario Manner from CCC Cologne. I'm organizing the SIGINT, and I was involved in the 29C3 uh, content team. And I'm talking about the conference management system, FREP, which is kind of a um, successor to Pentabuff, which was used um, this year for the conference. Um, uh, can you advance the slides like every 20 seconds? Because uh, they are really small. So it's a web-based conference planning system, which you can use to manage the conference and create a schedule, get uh, feedback from uh, visitors and stuff like that. It was created by the organizers of the FrostCon and uh, originally by David Rötzl. So um, it's uh, actually uh, a successor to Pentabaf, which was used uh, in the CCC Congress by the DEPCONF and others. And uh, basically, um, it's uh, a, a rewrite, a complete rewrite, uh, which tries to stay compatible in the important parts. Uh, FRAP is a logical successor. We have a migration path, and uh, Pentabuff isn't maintained anymore. The last commit is like three years ago, and uh, a lot of people have the problem how to upgrade their uh, Pentabuff in installation. So FRAP is basically Rails. It's standard Rails. It's Rails with a few GAMs, like KenKen for abilities, Hummel, and Twitter Bootstrap for the front-end code. So it's easy to adapt and easy to understand. So uh, we feature multi-conference support, and we have uh, role-based access controls for submitters, speakers, organizers. We integrate uh, ticket systems for the communication, RT and OTS at the moment. And we've got a JSON uh, export uh, if you want to program against the schedule. And uh, we're Pentabuff compatible. We have the, the same uh, XML format. If you had any scripts before um, that depended on that, they should work. And uh, we are maintainable, maintainable. We've got tests and database migrations, and we should support the three uh, databases. Yeah, uh, conferences actually using FRAP are, of course, the FrostCon for two years, the Zigint conference in Cologne, and uh, several um, other conferences like the MMCD and uh, the upcoming Hackover conference, for example. So uh, how do you go about making a conference? Because um, that's actually really simple. Um, you have to uh, create the conference in the software and uh, fill out all the values, like the title of the conference, the uh, acronym of the conference, and give it a subtitle. And then you have to add a conference days to the conference. So I um, spent a lot of time to make this work with actual time frames. So um, you can uh, have conference skip um, midnight, for example, because midnight is zero and zero is smaller than 23, which is kind of a problem for other softwares. And um, afterwards, you go into the call for participation phase, where um, speakers submit their talks. Um, there's a special interface for that. Here's the login page on screen, and the speaker adds his talk and uh, a description and stuff like that. So uh, here, this is the availability screen. Speakers are not there all the time. Some might uh, want to come by only for a few hours, so they can use these nifty slider controls to set up their availabilities. This is, again, real time, so uh, no uh, problems are to be expected there. And uh, afterwards, you go uh, and have the talks reviewed. And the reviewing process is uh, here uh, an example image uh, of an example review. So you can just uh, give some stars at a comment to the talk, and afterwards you can look at the talks and decide uh, by the reviews if uh, the community thinks that's a good talk. So we have a review role, which is only allowed to review talks and not to uh, accept or uh, um, reject the talk. So um, afterwards, uh, you have to go and uh, fill out all the details. You have to ask the speakers for more information and inform them of uh, acceptance or rejectance of their talks. And, uh, this is done by coordinators, and they manage uh, the uh, individual speakers. Of course, there's conferences uh, which only have uh, one or two people organizing the content, and it's uh, obviously it's easier. So this is a person page. A person page. It's um, just an example from software. You can see the other conferences. Uh, if the speaker is already known, you can decide by this information if you. I want to have them again. And then you can plan your actual schedule for your conference. You can drag and drop um, these events and put them there. And uh, afterwards, uh, you can publish the schedule. And uh, here is the conflict management. So if, uh, if the speaker isn't there, there would be a conflict here, uh, which you could resolve uh, later. 
yeah, then you can look at some statistics about your conference and uh, basically go about and uh, actually do the conference. Um, we have a static schedule export just like uh, Pentabuff has, so people um, can uh, download static pages, which is important for the performance of the whole thing. Yeah, so in the future we want to have a plugin system. We have plans on video integration, we want the better review system, like top 10 lists or something, and we definitely want sub-conference support to give more people the opportunity to uh, actually uh, work on content. Yeah, if you want to contact us and, uh, and just uh, via the mailing list or contact me in Java uh, and just fork the project on GitHub, start developing and give us a pull request. Thanks. All right. Now, th this this lightning talk, there there is a special uh, there's a special little bit at the end because uh, you attempted to submit a lightning talk last year, and there's a story about that at the end. So that won't count against your time uh, because I messed up last year, so I have to give you that. But without any further ado, are you ready to start your main presentation? Yeah. Go. All right. Um, I, I talk is about uh, a system we have in uh, Hackerspace Labitat. Um, which is for tracking all the inventory that you have in space, all the tools and uh, other equipment that you have, uh, some of that is uh, led to us by members. Slide. So, for example, this is a print uh, milling machine that we have, um, which has a label done in the, in the, in the front of it. Slide. Which you see here that it has a QR code and an ID, and then has a, problem, uh, a couple of tags like the do or not hack, uh, and then has uh, the sign in the middle that m uh, means that you need to read the manual first. Yeah, next. So this is the page for creating a new text, where it uh, in real time generates the PNG in the browser, and then when you save it, it uh, regenerates it with the right ID, and it uploads it uh, to, the, to the backend of it and uh, prints it on the printer. Next. Uh, and also has full text search support. Um, this is implemented using Postgres. And next. So the, the QR uh, code that is, uh, in includes a URL to uh, a redirection service that we have at LabTAT, uh, which then redirects to our wiki, where we have a template for LabTAT entries. And the, the other tag that is uh, uh, it's possible to have on the labels, um, that's a personal property of a member. Um, and next slide. Um, so uh, the backend is written in something called Lua Event Machine that uh, is written by Emil that is sitting over there in the corner. It's basically uh, um, um, it's sort of like Node.js with uh, having, but apart from that, it's, it has, uh, it uses some coroutines to make uh, asynchronous coding uh, just like it was synchronous, so that it, it uh, pauses the coroutine um, whenever it would block. Um, and then has the print queue and so on, and it's pretty basic. Um, so this is the printer on top of our fridge in the space. Um, and if you take the next slide. So usually this printer only has a 32-bit driver by a brother. Um, so it doesn't really work on 64-bit uh, uh, server. So we take next slide. So we reverse engineered it from the USB communication and wrote a new uh, driver in C, which reads the PNG and writes directly to the character device created by the Linux uh, kernel USB driver for printers. And uh, currently, lab, print, uh, lab track is uh, deployed in uh, our own space and in the room. Uh, and uh, next up will probably be Knightsbridge. And I've heard that our member in uh, the Mississippi area uh, have around six or seven other spaces lined up. Yeah, next slide. So the roadmap for this is to get some versioning control because right now everyone can go in and uh, just modify a label so it, and with no way to revert it other than the database backup. Um, and improving the search so that you can search about subwords and not just the full uh, text search support by Postgres. 
Um, and then uh, Yule is also working on uh, implementing a distributed search uh, across hackerspaces. Um, and we also would like to have some gallery with different stickers and, and uh, stuff that you might want to print out regularly. Um, yeah, so the source is at these URLs. And I'll recommend you to check out the Lua event machine. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. And now, very quickly, the missing talk about the Lua event machine and the story behind it. Yeah. Uh, last year, I pushed Esmil for holding a talk about his event machine. Um, and I haven't succeeded in it yet. Um, but at, an, at a party last year, we submitted a talk anyway. Um, but Nick didn't receive it. We'll take the next slide. We just did it with Sunnet uh, on a projector in the, in the Rumfahrt Agentur uh, hackerspace in Berlin. Um, and the next slide, you see that Google actually accepts the mail, but it, Nick didn't get it. So the next one, yeah, we also thought Nick should have that information. So maybe there'll be a talk about Lua Event Machine at some point in time. I don't know. But yes, I searched my mail extensively for this and occasionally ping back and try to find it. But nope, this, this talk somehow got accepted by Google, but never made it to me, unfortunately. So perhaps sometime in two years, it'll magically appear out of the ether. But quick round of applause <laughs> just for the missing. Please. Oh, okay. You were going to use your own laptop, so I think we're going to have to switch over to uh, the video over there. Are you? Uh... I'll unplug me. Well, it's okay. You're good. Okay, and your okay. five minutes starts now. Okay, so I'm Paul Ascanier. Um, we'll present you my project Malware.lu and a tool that we released last month. So Malware.lu is maintained by four people, me and three others. And the focus, the purpose of the project is to share uh, malware samples to researchers. So to present the project, I've put some numbers. For the moment, we share more than 4 million of unique samples. And we have a second part of the project is to, to provide technical article about malware analysis. And actually, we've got 26 articles. This 4 million of samples take a 7 gigabyte of disk. And we've got a database to be able to search a specific uh, sample. And the database uh, uh, use 7 gigabytes. The malware take uh, 3 terabytes of data. And we try to make money to buy business of reverse engineering or malware analysis of inc or incident response. So to have an account on malware.lu, we don't provide a classic form with uh, you put your username, etc., etc. To have an account, you have to write an email to us and explain why you want an account. And after that, we create the account. For the moment, we've got more than 1,000 of users, so we are not really strict. So you're able to make to search a specific sample with the hash of malware, but with the name too. In fact, we use the name provided by uh, antivirus. So if you would like, for example, sample link to Stuxnet, you can simply enter Stuxnet in the second form, and you've got all sample in the recent chip with Stuxnet. Once you find the specific sample you would like to download, you've got some information as the name of it uh, by uh, antivirus. So we are looking for people uh, to this project to give us some sample. Maybe we don't have uh, a complete database and you've got some interesting sample to put uh, on it. And we're looking for people uh, interesting to write technical article as an article to explain how to unpack specific malware, blah, blah, blah. 
And we released a first tool on called uh, Malwas. You can download it, uh, it's open source, you can download it on Google Code. And uh, I put online uh, a demo to, to, uh, to test it. You can connect to http malwas.com and you've got the, the application uh, online. In fact, this application is a plugin, an extension to Qco Sandbox. In fact, the malware that you would like to analyze is, is a start in a virtual machine managed by VirtualBox, and our tool monitors all the activity of the malware. All the activity is register value, flag value, instructions, tax, heap data, all memory information uh, during the execution of the malware. All this information is stored on a database, and you've got a web browser to be able to navigate on the data stored in the database. Most simple things is to show you a demo. So you, if you are used to use a debugger, is an offline debugger on your browser. Here, I don't show you uh, the malware executing in the virtual machine, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's a little bit long. But you've got here the results. And it's like a classic debugger. Can one minute use it and hit execute. You've got all register at the, the right, and you can, as a classic debugger, make following them. And the memory value is automatically updated here. Here you've got a timeline to go where you want to go on the the execution. That's all for me. Thanks. everybody. Um, my name is Harold and I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about a project of bringing the te technology and humanities to, uh, together. That's a cool uh, project that we are trying in Braunschweig, Germany and I would like to tell you a little bit about it. First of all, what is entrepreneurship uh, at all? An entrepreneur is a person who is setting up a business, a so-called uh, startup. But I believe uh, that sounds a little bit like it's all about making money, but I believe an entrepreneur is not uh, someone, entrepreneurship is not about making money. Entrepreneurship is actually about great ideas. Next slide, please. Um, it's about. It's not about making money. It's about great ideas. It's about better ideas than previous ones. It's about making something really genuinely new, and that's also what hacking is about. And I believe the creativity that uh, that we are all doing as hackers, um, and the creativity that of our entrepreneurs is not much different to to innovation in the industry. And um, let's so let's take a look of the to uh, let's take a look at Wikipedia at the definition of what um, um, hacking is. There it says the hacking the act of engaging in activities is in a spirit of playfulness and exploration is termed hacking. Hacking entails some form of excellence, for example, exploring the limits of what is possible. And hacking, as we've seen in many examples before, is. Um, often taking things apart in order to, order to understand it and put it together in an originally unattended uh, uh, manner. We also see that in art sometimes. In 1947, um, uh, Picasso took apart um, a bicycle sa saddle and a handlebar and put it into a new context and formed this uh, bull's head. And that's creativity. And we could use that creative thinking also in order to solve problems in the industry. One example is the uh, cell phone industry not uh, long ago, as about six years ago, the uh, mobile phone industry um, um, had two problems that came from uh, its megatrends. One megatrend was miniaturization, that is everything becomes smaller. The other one was uh, convergence, that means more and more functions get into a, even a smaller and smaller device. And that causes, of course, um, a problem in the industry 
interface. And that was solved, of course, not by uh, Nokia, who had great engineers and great managers, but by, by a, a, um, a company that had creative think thinkers as at its core. And that was, of course, um, slow down, please, with the, with the fire. Um, um, that was, of course, Apple, because they, they solved that problem of the industry by applying a, a touchscreen interface with a software keyboard um, that is only visible uh, when it's useful. So, um, and Steve Jobs, now we come to the quote on the next slide, said, part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. And, and we can solve such problems only, he said, next slide, if we are at the intersection of technology and liberal arts or humanities, if you like. And that's a, a great chance for a, a university. And um, that's what we are trying to establish in Braunschweig, because next slide, we have two universities there, an, an artistic university, that's the Braunschweig University of Arts and the Technical University. At the University of Arts, we offer degrees in the fine arts in industrial design, visual design, and media studies. The Techno University of Technology offers degrees in econom economics, life science, engineering, and computer science as well. And what we're trying to do is bring those two worlds together in, in order to, to, to uh, foster creati creative thinking and, and, and real creativity that is not only 10% better, but 10 times better. Um, that is next slide uh, that we do joint efforts. We do lightning talks like this one at first in order to understand each other's thinking, each other's ideas, each other's projects. We, we are making network events to bring those people together. We establish joint projects and host them in so-called co-working spaces. And we offer them advice and funding for those entrepreneurs. If you, um, that, this is a great and, and inspiring project. And if you want to know more about our project, next slide, this, this slide please, um, and uh, or if you know other similar projects that we can learn from, please get in contact with me um, as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, All good? Yes, ready. So um, my name is not super important. I am a cryptologist and code breaker based in London. Um, and um, I would like to advertise a group at LinkedIn, which is called Code Breakers, which, which already was advertised yesterday at one talk. And um, um, uh, this group is really um, everything which you think you could be called breaking. So it's different things for different people, like uh, data security, cryptography, cryptanalysis, hacking, digital forensics, and few other things. Um, if you look at few other groups which exist at, at LinkedIn, so some of them are listed here. So it's quite interesting because I think you should maybe take some time to compare uh, people who are in these groups. So in some of these groups, you find amazing people, amazing specialists, which have very high age index. You can find with Google Scholar. They have a lot of publications. They are major universities. They are major corporations. They know a lot of things. And yet some of these groups, they have almost, in my opinion, nobody who really is a specialist in cryptography or cryptanalysis, yet they are here on LinkedIn. So I think we need to um, um, thank LinkedIn for uh, introducing quite recently a system for um, you know, certifying the expertise of other people, uh, which is a very helpful uh, tool they have recently introduced. Uh, because otherwise maybe uh, you might end up being a member of the wrong group. So I leave you as an exercise to see which one of these groups is a strikingly strange uh, group. Uh, it's, it's here on this picture. Um, so um, another thing which we want to promote in this group is solidarity. So uh, we promote solidarity between code breakers from all walks of life, okay? So now maybe you think there is no need for solidarity of code breakers, okay? So uh, I will speak from experience. So uh, maybe you think that um, there is no censorship in today's research. Uh, maybe you think that major universities promote independent scientific research, while in fact they promote corruption and nepotism. 
Um, maybe you think that uh, journalists would by default write the truth and the lies are easy to dismiss. Maybe you think that the market will determine a fair price for your work and nobody would steal it. Uh, maybe you think that people who are visibly your friends you are still your friends when they are under the cover of uh, anonymity in a program committee. Um, maybe um, you think that uh, research should be free idea, source code, uh, should be free and available on open platforms and um, all the large corporate profits were earned by hard work and yet there is no relation between the two facts. Um, maybe you think that banks will need to prove that what they say is true in a court of law. Well, actually they will not have to, to prove that it's true. Uh, maybe you think that Alan Turing obviously did eat cyanide and another British uh, mathematician's prodigy actually did close himself in a plastic bag to commit suicide. So in that case, maybe you believe that code breaker solidarity is not important. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this was the next slide. Um, so just one more remark about the group. Uh, it is a, um, a closed group, so we check uh, requests to join. So we're, the minimum kind of uh, level of expertise we, re we require is a sort of master of science thesis in security relevant topics uh, level or equivalent professional experience. Um, uh, and so, so we just don't admit anybody. And the group is not open, so what is posted in the group is only visible to members. Thank you very much, and please join. Okay, I never got slides from Crunch about data mining the open cloud. Okay. Oh, uh, web out of browsers, Theo, are you? Okay, great, awesome. And then uh, this is the second to the last talk. The last talk um, is a presentation on LibreOffice. And then we have a very, very special bonus surprise uh -huh. at the end. So uh, are you guys ready to go? All good? Yes. OK, and then don't, don't forget, all you have to say is just slide when you want the next slide. Cool? Hi, I'm Flogistic, this is Theo, and this is Alf, and we're building a community and application collection for accessing data from websites, and that's called Weboob, slide. Uh, so what's Weboob? Weboob is a collection of application that lets you access, modify, and download, and do stuff to data. Usually you will uh, use a web browser to access, and then you can do it without a web browser. Technically, it consists of this collection of application and a collection of APIs that try to unify the, um, the functionalities of websites uh, for, for accessing them in a, in a unified way. Slide. Uh, so this is an example of how it works. We got uh, three applications for watching videos. Uh, one is called Video, and it works in common line. One, one is graphical, and one is web-based. But they all use the same unified API, so the, the implementation is really simple, and they access several video models. Uh, slide, Theo. Yeah. So basically, uh, most of websites uh, work the same way. Here, we have uh, some video websites. So they're all the same. If you go on RT or Canal Plus or Vimeo, you just want to search for videos and play videos. So you're doing the same thing you go on uh, YouPorn or the U European Parliament website. You just want to get the videos. But uh, you are a pervert if you go on the European Parliament uh, website. Slide, please. Uh, same thing applies for uh, Weaver websites. Uh, you just want to select a, site, a city and get forecasts. Slide. Slide, please. Uh, here again, uh, same thing for torrents. You just want to get uh, torrents and download the torrents uh, because uh, you're a nasty pirate. Slide, please. So why do we use uh, Weboob? It's better for privacy. You don't uh, download uh, the crap, uh, you know, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, uh, follow me on uh, anything, uh, Google Plus One. Uh, the web is bloated. Each page you get in a, in a browser, uh, you get a shitload of uh, JavaScript, CSS, uh, images, videos, and flash uh, stuff, crap. Uh, you don't get that with Weboob. It's accessible. Um, most, web 
most web pages are not accessible to uh, blind people because screen reader can't read it, or people that can aim precisely to, uh, with a mouse, uh, we would just uh, give pure data and is more accessible. It's hackable. You can use anything that goes on that goes out with Boob in a said, out, grep, or anything, and it's faster. With one query, you can query dozens of websites. Slide, please. And of course, possibilities of WebHub are the same as this website that we interact with. Uh, we have an application, for example, to find a house where you can export read paper, um, a newspaper in an article in a readable format that uh, takes in email or a file for your ebook readers. Uh, and you can optimize your, your um, sexual life with, um, on a dating website. Slide, please. Short, an overview on a particular application, very popular in France. We uh, support more than 15 web, uh, bank websites, and uh, we can access uh, on your balance, your historic of transaction, your coming operation, as well as like, make a transfer, a money transfer. And we have the support of Butch Insight. This is a startup on the make money with a solution based on a web boob. Slide, please. On für unsere deutsche Publikum haben wir leider nicht so viel zu admitten, aber wir haben schon ein paar Module. Wir haben zwei Zeitungen, die Tages die bekannte Tageszeitung und Presse Rob, die eigentlich äh, äh, Artikel auf ganz Deutsch, äh, Deutsch Europa übersetzt in Strengsprache. Und wir haben auch die journalistische Orwasserlage in Sachsen. Und äh, zum Beispiel, wir, Sie können wissen, dass wir Dresden heute Alarmstufe 1 erreicht. Slide, please. Und jetzt, yes, to contact us, you can use. Uh, See your website, there is a lot of information on uh, channel IRC. Thank you. All right, and you're all good. This is, I believe, just one quick question. Did anybody attempt to submit a lightning talk and get absolutely no response over email? Okay, good, that, that was comforting. I just wanted to take that quick uh, second. Um, everything good? Yes. Okay, five minutes starts now. Okay, I'm Bjarne Michaelsen. I'm uh, an elected member of the board of the Document Foundation, and I want to talk a little bit about LibreOffice and uh, the Document Foundation, the institution behind it. Next slide. Um, so first, why should you care? Currently, the alternatives are, well, you can use Microsoft Office and SharePoint, and that's not hackable, it's closed source, and it's not fun to work with. Or you can put all your data in the cloud and hope nobody does anything evil with it. Um, I think we need a third alternative, which is an open source solution. Next. So LibreOffice was announced as a fork of OpenOffice in September 2010, and the intent was to get it more independent of one corporate sponsor and get more people involved. And uh, next slide, thank you. And as forks happen, there are epic flame fests, and uh, I was working at Oracle at that point in time. So I took my part in that and said this all won't work, and uh, this is tricky, and uh, people Next slide, told me different, and six months later, I uh, joined another company and was not with Oracle anymore. Next slide, which, uh, as it turns out, both the fork and uh, changing my employer was probably a good decision because only six weeks later, Oracle announced that OpenOffice will become a community project, uh, which is a uh, um, buzzword for uh, we will fire everyone in Hamburg. And uh, so uh, it was good probably to fork LibreOffice and for me to join another company. So uh, with the foundation, next slide please. That took a while, probably because we're not only five old farts trying to invade Texas, but actually do something uh, a bit more tricky, which was, next slide, we wanted to uh, protect the foundation against uh, being uh, hijacked by one corporate entity. And uh, to do that, we had the members of the TDF based only on contribution. You can't buy your way in. So you have to contribute to the project to become a member. And from that on, you elect everyone. You elect the guys who uh, allow others to go become members, and you also elect the board of directors and the, board, the people who make all the other decisions. Next slide. 
So um, I could, did we do any work? Well, I could talk about features, but that would take an hour just for the new stuff we did in 2012. So I'll just put up some numbers. And below you see a lot of public entities uh, going with the uh, LibreOffice and moving to it. So uh, this is quite good. Next. And our downloads also look good and are getting better and better. So uh, how does it work with actually getting a community involved and not only one or multiple corporate entities? Slide. Well, you can see the Hackfests here. The first one up in the left is in uh, Hamburg, in the Attractor. In the lower right, you see the Hackfest in Munich, which uh, was at the Linux project. And you can see we attract quite a uh, big crowd, and we uh, use our donations, for example, to fly uh, developers in from, from everywhere to that. So uh, those all happened to, for the second time, and we will continue uh, with them. Next slide. Again, for you need a corporate sponsor to do that. This is the LibreOffice conference in Berlin. That's around 200 people in three tracks over um, three days. And it's in the Ministry of Economics and Technology. So, well, yeah, you can do that with, an, uh, with a community. Next slide. There's lots of other stuff. By the way, we were at Fosterm last year. We will be uh, at Fosterm next year. So if you're interested in more technical talks, we have a death room there. Please join. Um, thanks. Next slide. Apropos technical topics, this is uh, one example of what, what happened. You know bisecting, maybe, which is searching for a regression. Minute. Okay which is searching for regression in, uh, in the progress. And um, well, uh, for LibreOffice, you can't do that. Building LibreOffice 20 times is not an option. Next slide. So what we did is put 262 LibreOffice builds in one Git repository, the binaries. And with that, QA engineers can walk through 18 months of LibreOffice history and find when the bug was introduced without ever compiling LibreOffice once. And all that is in 60 megs for one compile. So it compresses ex excellently. 30 Next. seconds. Next slide. Um, well, I also have LibreOffice running on a Nexus 7, just uh, for, if you want to look at it, can show you later. Next slide. The long tail of LibreOffice development shows you, well, we have a lot of co contributors who are small contributors. This is good because you can, with five commits, become part of that. And it is also good for the project because to get more of those, we need more of those. Thank you. And uh, now the moment that at least three people were waiting for. Because it would not be a lightning talk session without bringing back the gentleman that has keys. I have keys. <laughs> yeah. I have keys for all. And um, I offer, offer one key for one giga euro. This is next. Next, uh, for the airport uh, Tempelhof, I buy the airport, the whole airport, because I have keys. Next, and um, uh, I offer one key for 1024. Do you see it? Next, and this is uh, I make last year a mistake about a few uh, millions, and this is uh, now right. This is one giga euro. I offer one key. You can. Um, pay and buy this key, and for the other keys for a million, you can only pay a deposit next. So then we built a machine, a temple machine, at the Temple of Afield, and we rocked their uh, endless celebration. 8,760 hours every year, and sometimes one day longer. Next. So it looks inside. Next. At the Temple of Afield. Next. There, in the middle of Tempelhof, next, next, yes, we do it, next, <laughs> the machine inside, next, from above, and next, 
So, then we dance a lot and uh, we see us then in the machine at Tempelhof. I hope the next years. Yeah, next. So, if you want to donate, uh, you can do it uh, next year. I have uh, keys then also in steel uh, or copper or silver or in gold. And you can only pay a deposit for this because we need the interest and we made the party then from the interest of the money. Next. So, you will find me or us uh, there and uh, follow for news uh, at Twitter. Next. So, thanks a lot, and then we see us in the machine to the party. <laughs> so, and um, I have uh, here some stickers um, with love, and you can uh, get them the stickers at the entrance. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Um, all right, did, I believe that's everybody, and that is the final round of lightning talks. Please stick around uh, if you are interested in taking part in the flash mob um, later on today. How many people have shown up for that? Okay, other than that, uh, please, a huge round of applause for the lightning talks. Everybody that presented, everybody that, uh, that took part, and everybody that participated, and everybody that tried to submit but couldn't get in. Thank you. Thank you.